The Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability is now in session. Please sit down. Good morning, everybody, both here and uh, watching more remotely. I welcome everybody this morning to uh, this public hearing 13 of the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability. The principal purpose of this uh, five-day hearing uh, at Homebush is to examine the experiences of people with disability who are NDIS participants and who live in a, dis a disability residential setting managed by a service provider, Sunnyfield Disability Services. We commence, uh, as always, with an acknowledgement of country. We wish to acknowledge uh, the one girl uh, people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, upon whose lands Commissioner Gelbally is sitting. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We also pay our respects to all First Nations people attending the hearing in person today, as well as those viewing the hearing on the live stream. Let me deal with the resumption of hearings. Exactly uh, 15 months and six days ago, on 18 February 2020, the Royal Commission commenced a 10-day hearing at this very venue. The subject matter of that hearing was health care and services for people with cognitive disability, and that was the last time before the COVID pandemic struck uh, that uh, the Royal Commission was able to hold a hearing at which uh, members of the public could actually attend in person. As people who have been following the work of the Royal Commission will know, we were forced to suspend public hearings for a period of six months because of the pandemic. We resumed our program of public hearings in August 2020 with Public Hearing 5, which examined the experiences of people with disability in the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic. That hearing and the seven hearings that followed have been conducted remotely without members of the public being able to observe the proceedings firsthand. Of course, it has always been possible to follow hearings through the Royal Commission's live stream of the proceedings. Today's hearing marks the return of public hearings in the fullest sense. We hope that all of the further hearings of the Royal Commission leading up to presentation of our final report, now due in September 2023, will also be open to all members of the public who wish to attend. Whether this proves to be the case in practice obviously depends upon the success of the, Australi of the Australian community and the authorities in preventing further outbreaks of COVID-19. At today's hearing, I am joined by Commissioner Alastair McEwen AM in Sydney, or in Homebush. Commissioner Rhonda Galbally AC has not yet been able to leave Melbourne, so she is joining the hearing remotely from Victoria. Commissioner Rosalind Atkinson AO was to participate in this hearing, but as was publicly announced last Friday, she has tendered her resignation as a commissioner for personal reasons. I wish to uh, record on behalf of all commissioners our profound appreciation for Commissioner Atkinson's invaluable contributions to our work and our regret that she is leaving the Royal Commission. Commissioner Atkinson has contributed tirelessly to all facets of our many activities and has provided many significant insights into the complex policy and rights issues we face. We thank her most sincerely for her contributions and wish her well for the future. Let me say something about our shifting focus and turn first to the past. In my opening remarks at Public Hearing 4, I explained the distinctive nature of this Royal Commission when compared with others. In particular, I pointed to the extraordinary breadth of our terms of reference which, among other things, require us to inquire 
into what should be done to prevent and better protect people with disability from experiencing violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. The terms of reference also stress the importance of exposing violence against and abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability in all settings and contexts. There are many aspects of the work of the Royal Commission, receiving and processing submissions, which now number nearly 2,500, publishing issues, papers, and overviews of responses to issues papers. We have now published 13 issues papers and received nearly 600 responses, many of which are extremely detailed and very helpful. Conducting an extensive uh, research program and publishing numerous research reports, holding many forms of community engagement, including, of course, engagements with First Nations people and uh, cold people and communities, and conducting private sessions both remotely and now more often in person. We have held 372 private sessions to date. Public hearings are therefore only one aspect of the Royal Commission's work, but they are a very important part. Public hearings provide the forum for investigating the many complex and difficult issues uh, that uh, uh, arising in a multitude of settings in which people with disability are exposed to the risk of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. Hearings also provide a forum to examine the conduct, including a failure to act, of governments, institutions, commercial entities and individuals that may have contributed to the violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation experienced by people with disability in our community. The hearings provide an opportunity for people with disability, their families and supporters, together with the wider Australian community, to follow the work of the Royal Commission in real time. Up to date at hearings, we have concentrated on exposing systemic failings that affect the well-being of people with disability in areas that seem to be as diverse as education, healthcare, group homes, the use of restraints such as psychotropic drugs, the criminal justice system and employment. I say seem to be diverse because a critical theme that has emerged from the Royal Commission's work in the two years since we were established is the interconnectedness of the experiences of people with disability throughout the course of their lives. The issues we are addressing cannot be considered in isolation from each other. We have examined these issues through accounts of people with lived experience of disability or where this has not been possible through accounts given by family members or supporters. We have identified the crucial policy questions that must be addressed if transformational changes are to be achieved. As part of this process, we have sought to explore the reasons for the systemic failures that have contributed to violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability. In the hearings, we have, from time to time, sought explanations from those responsible for delivering services or for ensuring that the human rights of people with disability are respected. We have had occasion to challenge some of these explanations and we have made some findings and recommendations about systemic failures and identified numerous matters, specific matters, for further investigation. The results can be seen in the Commissioner's reports of public hearings, of which four have been published to date, with a fifth on public hearing six addressing the use of chemical restraints on people with disability. The sixth will be the uh, fifth of the uh, Commissioner's reports dealing with public hearing six will be published shortly. Let me turn to what is in effect a new phase. The Royal Commission has always intended to explore issues relating to the quality of NDIS uh, funded services and supports and the adequacy of uh, external oversight and accountability mechanisms. The personal experiences of people with disability conveyed through submissions private sessions and other forms of engagement have reinforced the importance of this aspect of the Royal Commission's work. In a sense, this hearing marks a move to a new phase of our investigations. 
we intend to undertake a for forensic analysis of case studies involving allegations of violence, abuse, neglect or exploitation directed to or experienced by people with disability who are participants in the NDIS. This will be the approach taken at this hearing. The next hearing, public hearing 14, scheduled to commence on the 7th of June in Adelaide, and at least two additional hearings later this year. Nothing I have said should be taken as expressing any view by commissioners about the evidence to be adduced at this hearing, whether it is appropriate for commissioners to make findings about the conduct of any party will depend upon the nature of the evidence that is given and will require careful consideration by commissioners of uh, any submissions made by council assisting and the parties who have leave or will have leave to appear. The significance of the case studies goes beyond a consideration of the actions of particular service providers or regulatory bodies in specific situations. The case studies are intended to illuminate the practices and policies of NDIS service providers and of the regulators insofar as they affect the well-being and human rights of people with disability who are participants in the NDIS. Let me provide some very basic data. There will be, I am sure, more detail in uh, the evidence, but let me provide some basic data to provide context for this hearing. As at September 2020, the NDIS had 412,543 participants. Nearly three quarters of these were people with autism or intellectual, psychosocial or developmental delay disability. About half of NDIS participants were aged 18 or under. First Nations participants comprised 6.6% of all NDIS participants that is 27,109, while culturally and linguistically diverse participants comprise 9.27% of all NDIS participants, that is 38,252. Most, although not necessarily all of the case studies to be examined at hearings, including this hearing, will include NDIS participants who live in what is called Specialist Disability Accommodation, or SDA. SDA is how the NDIS funds specialist housing for NDIS participants with very high support needs. It is a form of capital funding for the provision of dwellings, that is the bricks and mortar, not the services and supports that are delivered to the residents of the SDA, SDA dwelling. In December 2020, the NDIA recorded that there were 5,978 SDA dwellings with a total capacity of 17,155 residents. The actual number of residents in SDA dwellings three months earlier was 15,667. Most SDA dwellings involve what are called cash arrangements. 65, uh, of those, 65% have a capacity of one to three residents. Nearly one third, 31%, are group homes with a capacity of four to five residents, while only 4% or 200 SDA dwellings have a capacity of six residents or more. In September 2020, there were 9,150 active NDIS service providers across Australia. They provided a wide range of supports and services for NDIS participants, but only 228 active NDIS service providers were registered to provide SDA supports. As I've already indicated, SDA supports are separate to the services that are provided to someone in their home to assist with independent living. Those services are provided by funding known as Supported Independent Living, or SIL. A number of investigations and inquiries have, in, have already considered the interaction between SDA and SIL funding on a broader level. These include the review of the National Disability Insurance Scheme Act that was conducted uh, recently and is known as the TUNE Review, 
and a review undertaken by the Joint Standing Committee on the NDIS's re report into supported independent living. NDIS service providers actually provide the services to people with di disability living in SDA dwellings. While the two reports I have mentioned considered the interaction of SDA and SIL funding on a systemic level, this hearing will consider the interaction of those two types of funding in the context of a single disability residential setting operated by one service provider. As we shall hear, in the course of these forensic uh, hearings that the Royal Commission proposes to undertake, there will be a number of issues examined, systemic or policy issues. They include, without being exhaustive, the governance of service providers, the recruitment, training and supervision of disability support workers, including the casualisation of disability staff, internal complaints handling and investigations of allegations of violence, abuse, neglect or exploitation, communications between service providers and regulators and the families and supporters of people with disability, the role of community visitors or similar oversight mechanisms and the role of external bodies such as the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission and police where complaints or allegations contain, uh, concern criminal conduct. It can be readily seen by anybody who's been following the work of the Royal Commission that many of these issues have already received attention to some extent in our public hearings. For example, public hearing three on group homes considered complaint handling mechanisms and the role of external agencies in monitoring the treatment of people with disability in group homes. This reflects a point that has been made at a number of other hearings. The fundamental task of this Royal Commission is encapsulated by the requirement in the terms of reference that we investigate, and here I'm quoting, what should be done to promote a more inclusive society that promotes the independence of people with disability and their right to live free from violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. The subject matter of the 12 hearings to date and the evidence that has been received constitutes, as I've said it earlier, a mosaic, if, or if you prefer, prefer a more humble simile, the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle that the Royal Commission will need to assemble in an integrated and coherent manner in our final report. Um, I shall now take appearances. Commission pleasers, my name is Kate Eastman. I'm Senior Counsel assisting the Royal Commission and I appear today with Miss Elizabeth Bennett. Thank you, Ms Eastman. Uh, can I take other appearances uh, who will presumably be representatives participating remotely. Can we start with the Commonwealth? Good morning. K.E. Downs with Mr. B. Dighton, instructed by Gilbert and Tobin for the Commonwealth. And you are not appearing remotely. You are actually here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Chair. <laughs> That's right. Well, why don't you come up to a uh, table? That might be useful, if you wish. Yeah, there's a matter for you, but please do. You might need a chair, that's the only thing. Yeah, that's all Sorry, right. can I jump in, Chair? Um, all of these pieces of equipment in front of you are screens, and you'll see that behind us there's a bar table, and then again behind are the further bar tables. So there's a reason why we can't use these? These are screens, not tables. All right, okay, I apologise. Back to the status quo ante. All right, who's next? New South Wales, I think. Gail Furness, and I appear with Trent Glover for the State of New South Wales, instructed by the Crown Solicitor General. Thank you very much, Ms Furness. Ms. Furness um, I think there is an appearance for South Australia, is there not? No? No, I thought there was going to... Sorry. Yes, thank you, Ms Furness. All right. Uh, there is, I think, an appearance for Sunnyfield, is that correct? Commissioners, my name is Duggan. I appear for Sunnyfield. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Duggan. Are there any other appearances? 
Commissioner, good morning. O'Brien's my name. I appear for the witness, Eliza. Binary vote. Yes, thank you. Is there any other appearance? Uh, Chair, there may be some further appearances as witnesses appear during the course of this week, but I think that completes the appearances this morning. All right, thank you very much. Yes, Ms Eastman. Royal Commissioners, we also acknowledge and pay our respects to the traditional custodians on the land on which we are meeting today. We pay our respects to First Nations elders, past, present and emerging and as well as all First Nations people following this public hearing. As the Chair has noted in his opening remarks, this is the first of a number of public hearings that will focus on registered NDIS providers and other service providers. This case study will examine the experiences of Melissa, Carl and Chen. They live together in what is commonly called a group home in Western Sydney. Since the 1st of May 2017, they have received accommodation and support services from a non-government disability service provider, Sunnyfield Disability Services. Sunnyfield is a member-based, for-purpose, not-for-profit registered charity providing support services for over 1,200 people living with disability in New South Wales and the ACT. It has been in operation for about 70 years. Sunnyfield operates 48 homes for 215 residents and Sunnyfield has a staff of over 1,700. Now, Royal Commissioners, you should be aware that Melissa Carl and Chen continue to reside at the house and receive services from Sunnyfield. This week, you will hear evidence that the relationships between the families and Sunnyfield has been strained and difficult. <coughs> Melissa and Carl's family are concerned that Melissa, Carl and Chen will not experience any detriment because of this hearing. Chen and his family have not provided evidence for this public hearing, but Chen was involved in the incidents where he experienced violence and abuse in the house. Sunnyfield has also expressed its concern about the impact of this hearing on their clients. So noting these concerns, Commissioners, you have made orders for pseudonyms to be used for Melissa Carl and Chen, their family members and the employees of Sunnyfield who worked in the house as support workers or coordinators. Before addressing the issues to be explored in this hearing, we must warn people watching or listening to this hearing that I am about to describe incidents of violence and abuse which are likely to be distressing and confronting for many people. The Royal Commission encourages people who may be distressed to seek support. For people attending the hearing at Homebush, the Royal Commission's counselling team are on site and may be contacted for support. And I also note, as you will see on the screen, the contact details for various counselling services, including the Blue Knot Foundation. The details for Blue Knot, which is a specialist counselling and support referral service for people with disability, their families and carers, are available on the Royal Commission's website. <coughs> Commissioners, I'm going to start with Melissa. Melissa is 23 years old. As a child, Melissa was diagnosed with Prader-Willi syndrome. Prader-Willi syndrome is a chromosomal condition that affects multiple systems in the body. For Melissa, this has resulted in intellectual disability and impaired physical development. She also lives with autism and post-traumatic stress disorder. People with Prader-Willi system or syndrome 
want to eat constantly because they never feel full. The expression used in medicine is hyperphagia. This means Melissa requires support because of the inability to control food intake and support for daily living generally. You will hear that it takes someone who's suitably skilled and knows her and takes time with her to understand how to communicate properly with her. Melissa lived with her mother until she was about 13 years old. Melissa's sister, Eliza, will give evidence shortly. She will tell you that in 2011, her mother was overwhelmed and a crisis situation developed. Eliza realised that Melissa could not live with her mother anymore. And at that time, the only way they could get Melissa into full-time residential care is if they legally abandoned her at Melissa's respite service. That is what they had to do to legally abandon Melissa. Melissa has now lived in residential disability accommodation for 10 years. And she's lived at the house in Western Sydney since early 2016. Eliza is Melissa's guardian. Eliza lives in a regional town some distance from Sydney and she comes to Sydney and sees Melissa at the house about every three months. So Eliza relies on the staff at the house, particularly the house manager, to provide her with reliable, accurate information about what is happening in the house. Eliza will give evidence today to tell you about the arrangements that she and the other families made from late 2016 for Sunnyfield to take over the operation of the house commencing on 1 May 2017. Eliza will also tell you that from about mid-2017, she began to have concerns about some incidents in the house and the impact these incidents could have on Melissa. For example, one of her early complaints was to inquire as to how Melissa broke her finger. Eliza tried to raise her concerns and made a number of complaints about what was happening in the house at Sunnyfield. Eliza also made complaints to other agencies, including a complaint to the New South Wales Ombudsman. Matters came to a head. By the 4th of June 2018, Sunnyfield told Eliza it would terminate Melissa's services with effect from the 5th of September 2018. Sunnyfield told Eliza that if new, a new accommodation provider and new accommodation could not be found by the 5th of September, Eliza would need to assume responsibility for Melissa's accommodation and support from that point on. Eliza will tell you this came out of the blue for her. She was terrified that Melissa was going to lose her home and deeply concerned about the impact this would have on Melissa. Two days after receiving what was in effect an eviction notice, Eliza and the organisation working with Melissa as a support coordinator notified the NDIA of Melissa's change of circumstances and they requested the NDIA increase Melissa's support coordination funds to find alternative accommodation. Eliza also asked Sunnyfield why it had decided to terminate Melissa's services and effectively evict Melissa. On 13 June 2018, Sunnyfield's general manager of Shared Living wrote to Eliza. It told Eliza that it was not in Sunnyfield's overall best interest to continue to provide services in an environment where Eliza so clearly lacked trust in Sunnyfield, our staff and our policies. Ms Cudahy, who will give evidence later this week, is the CEO of Sunnyfield. And she will tell you that the decision to terminate Melissa's services were not made lightly. 
Ms Cudahy will tell you that Sunnyfield considered the potential impacts on Melissa, but Sunnyfield, quote, formed the view that, on balance, it was concerned for the well-being of staff due to the levels of stress that they were reported, that they reported. And, quote, Sunnyfield was also concerned that issues reported by staff, as she identified above, had resulted in a situation that it was not in Melissa's best interest to remain. By the 13th of June, Melissa's support coordinator told the NDIA that 13 organisations had been contacted in relation to vacancies for alternative accommodation. No suitable accommodation had been identified. Eliza, by this stage, was deeply concerned that Melissa would become homeless. Eliza made a complaint about the proposed eviction to the New South Wales Ombudsman and also to the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. She also contacted her local media and <coughs> member and approached the media. You will hear this week from Mr Graham Head, the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commissioner, that the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission identified this complaint as, quote, high risk. And it was one of the earliest complaints received by the Commission that had commenced its operations in New South Wales on the 1st of July 2018. You will hear how the Commission responded to the complaint and the action it took. And you will hear that the Commission did not have the power to compel Sunnyfield to provide supports to Melissa. In December 2018, Sunnyfield and Melissa participated in a mediation. Ms Cudahy will tell you at the mediation, Sunnyfield agreed to continue to provide services for Melissa while Eliza sourced alternative accommodation and services for her. Ms Cudahy will tell you this week that Eliza has not provided any update on the status of this process. The Commissioners, you will observe, it is now May 2021. Eliza will tell you that after two years and despite her efforts, along with those of multiple support coordinators and advocates, they have not found suitable new accommodation for Melissa. When COVID-19 struck last year, they stopped looking. Melissa remains at the house. Sunnyfield has never formally withdrawn the eviction notice. Melissa continues to live with the threat of eviction looming over her. However, Eliza's present understanding is that the eviction could not now be enforced as too much time has passed, but she'll tell you that it still worries her. Ms Cudahy will tell you at the present time it is, quote, not clear to me whether Melissa's guardian is still seeking to find alternative accommodation. Ms Cudahy will also tell you that at the present time, Sunnyfield's concern for staff wellbeing at the house is ongoing. Commissioners, communications between service providers and their clients and families are plainly of key importance. In this hearing, we will examine the policies and protocols in place for communication between the families of the house residents and Sunnyfield. Sunnyfield has a communication protocol for coordinating communications between a client's circle of support and Sunnyfield. The purpose of this protocol is said to be to foster communication that supports the client's dignity, choice and opportunity. Over the course of this week, you will hear from Eliza and Sunnyfield about the breakdown in communication and the relationship between them, which resulted in Sunnyfield deciding to evict Melissa. 
we will examine why Sunnyfield's communication protocol appears to have failed with respect to Eliza and Sunnyfield and what this means in terms of consequences for Melissa. Many of the communications between Sunnyfield and Eliza appeared to be viewed by Sunnyfield as defensive, tense and ultimately hostile. Some of the communication issues were elevated to Ms Cudahy as the CEO. And one example is an email from the 28th of September 2017 from the regional manager to the CEO complaining about Eliza's, and I quote, passive aggressive communication that she's bombarding us with and suggesting that Sunnyfield needs to, quote, shut it down. Then, in October 2017, a house manager at the home described Eliza as unhinged. Around this time, Sunnyfield was considering training with the New South Wales Ombudsman on, quote, managing unreasonable complainant conduct. By 2019, an adversarial relationship between Eliza on one hand and Sunnyfield on the other was entrenched. So much so that internal Sunnyfield documents referred to Eliza as highly demanding and querulant. We will explore these issues. Can I next turn to Carl? Carl is 24 years old and Carl's family comes from Lebanon. They've lived in Australia since 1998. Carl, who you will meet tomorrow uh, with a special video that's been prepared, loves dancing, music and being with his family. He loves the trampoline and the swings, he loves being at the park and he loves going for drives. He also loves being in water and he used to enjoy swimming. Carl's mother is Sophia. She will tell you that Carl and his younger sister were both born blind. When Carl was about four years old, Sophia started to notice that Carl's cognitive behaviour and motor skills were not developing as fast as her daughter's. Carl was diagnosed with autism. He lives with a severe intellectual disability. Sophia will tell you that as Carl grew, his behaviours became more challenging. And she, had, she and her husband had to make a decision. When Carl was 11 years old, he went to live at a boarding school for children with profound disabilities. Carl would live at school from Monday to Friday and then spend the weekends at home with his family. Sophia will tell you that this worked well until the school closed down about two years before Carl was due to finish high school. At this stage, Carl was almost an adult and his strength and behaviours of concern meant that it was impossible for him to live at home with his family. So Carl moved into a residential property operated by a service provider in New South Wales. And about four years later, he moved into the current house that was built for him and the other young people with disability, including Melissa and Chen. The house is not far away from where Sophia and her family live in Western Sydney. Now, because Sophia was at the house frequently, she got to know a number of the support workers who were working with Carl from 2017. And her impression visiting the house was that the staff were often stressed. But she says she wanted to maintain a professional relationship with the staff and so she didn't ask them to tell her why they were stressed. That changed in May 2019. Sophia began to notice just how anxious Carl was around one particular support worker who we will refer to as SP2. In June 2019, matters came to a head for Sophia after speaking to some of the staff. And Commissioners, you'll hear about Sophia's concern and how she sought to address those concerns. 
Around mid-June 2019, a staff member shared the staff member's concerns with Sophia. The staff member said that she was worried about Kyle's safety and the staff member said she couldn't forgive herself if something happened to Kyle and she hadn't told anyone. This caused Sophia significant worry. It was also around this time that Sophia had learnt that a few months earlier, when the Christchurch mosque shooting had occurred, that there was a news segment about the shooting on the television that was on in the house. A staff member told Sophia that another support worker, who I call SP1, said words to the effect, and I quote, if it was up to me, I would have shot them all. SP1 made the comments about the victims of the shooting being Middle Eastern. The staff member said that she responded to SP1 with words to the effect, how can you say that? Carl is Middle Eastern. And SP1 replied, I don't care. When Sophia heard this conversation and that it had occurred in March 2019, she said it was absolutely shocking. Very shortly after, or on the 20th of June, SP1 called Sophia to tell her that Carl had been injured in the Sunnyfield van during an outing. When Carl had returned to the home, support workers had observed that there was blood throughout the van. On the following day, Friday 21 June, at around 4.40pm, the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission received an anonymous telephone complaint about SP1 and SP2's treatment of both Carl and Chen. The anonymous complainant alleged that SP1 and SP2 uh, suggested that Carl and Chen had been physically pushed, grabbed and subjected to verbal abuse. The anonymous complainant alleged SP1 and SP2 had used racist and insensitive language about African and Indian support workers. It was alleged SP1 told people that he was at a meeting, but in fact he'd left the house and had gone fishing. And this had occurred on a regular basis. An allegation was also made that SP1 had been terminated from his previous employment with an organisation providing services and, um, to in aged and disability settings. Shortly after, at some time between 5.20 and 5.30 on that Friday afternoon, the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission telephoned Sunnyfield's Senior Risk and Compliance Manager and expressed serious concerns about the provision of services to Carl and Chen in the house. Now, pausing here, Chen has complex support and behaviour support needs. Chen's family are from an Asian background and English is not their first language. The records produced to the Royal Commission revealed Chen's family reported that he had had unexplained bruising on his thigh in around July 2018. Now coming back to the sequence of events. On the 24th of June, Sophia received a phone call from a support worker at the house. Sophia was told that Carl had had a major behaviour and that he had split his eyelid open. Sophia arrived at the house before the ambulance arrived and she saw Carl's eye injury. It was bleeding and it looked terrible. She then travelled in the ambulance with Carl and they were both very upset. While she was in the ambulance, and this is around 10.30 a.m. in the morning, Sophia spoke with the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. She provided details to the Commission about the events that had occurred over the previous week, including the incident in the van and the injury to uh, Carl's, Carl's upper eye. 
Pa was treated in hospital and he received stitches for the injury. On the following day, the 25th of June 2019, Sophia also contacted the general manager of shared living at Sunnyfield. The contact was about the incidents because Sophia was very concerned about Carl's well-being in the house. Later that day, Sunnyfield suspended SP1 on pay. SP1 denied any misconduct. Then the, day, the next day, Sunnyfield suspended SP2 on pay and SP2 denied any misconduct. And it should be noted that the records indicate that SP2 had been given a final warning much earlier on the 7th of September 2018. By the 29th of June, Sunnyfield told the Quality and Safeguards Commission that SP1 and SP2 were suspended pending an investigation. An independent investigation had been arranged and the allegations had been provided to the police for investigation. With respect to the independent investigation, Sunnyfield engaged Jennifer Piod to investigate the allegations about SP1 and SP2 concerning Carl and Chen. Ms Piod will give evidence about her experience as an independent investigator, the terms of reference for her investigations, the nature of her investigations, and you'll have before you commissioners a copy of her findings in her reports. Ms Piod interviewed Sophia in early 2019. What we also know from the internal records is by the 27th of July, Sunnyfield was asking itself, how could this have occurred? What had happened? And in an email that was sent from uh, one of the Sunnyfield staff to the CEO, Ms Cudahy, the report said this, how could this have happened, question. A boiling frog scenario appears to have occurred at the house. Due to the querulant complaints of one guardian, a protectionist approach has occurred towards staff. Also, due to the high level of client disability and behaviours, it has masked a potential causation. Several Sunnyfield response team investigations did not substantiate previous allegations raised. Regional managers have been naive and distracted by seemingly endless NDIS-driven administration, along with Sunnyfield's need to re-roster to ensure compliance with the relevant industrial award. The House Coordinator has been very good at covering up and deceitful in his behaviour that has gone undetected. The staff have been intimidated, racially vilified and frightened of this gun-owning coordinator. And knowing that the protected other support worker and the vital need for their job. Sunnyfield Q&A audits have not involved staff other than the coordinator, the commissioners at SP1. HR did not follow up on complaints and exit interview negative feedback regarding SP1. The document then sets out a series of learnings. But commissioners, you may be able to conclude, but by the 27th of July 2019, Sunnyfield itself had diagnosed the reasons the problems. On the 24th of July, the New South Wales Police charged SP1 with five counts of common assault, two counts of stalking slash intimidation, with respect to alleged incidents that had occurred between March 2019 and June 2019 in relation to Carl and Chen. Sophia will tell you that towards the end of July 2019, she was told by the police that charges had been laid against SP2 in relation to the incidents of alleged abuse of Carl. 
and the police would be in touch when they had a hearing date for the court case. The police did not interview Sophia and did not interview Carl. Sophia attended the first court hearing in November 2019 and there was another hearing in March 2020 in relation to SP2. She will tell you about her experience listening to the evidence presented at court. She was horrified by some of the allegations against SP2 that came out during the court proceedings and she and her husband found it to be very confronting. The magistrate found that the evidence was insufficient and the charges against SP2 were dismissed. Sophia and her husband were very disappointed by the outcome. On 29 August 2019, the New South Wales Police charged SP1 with one count of assault, occasionally actually bo actual bodily harm, in relation to the allegations SP1 kicked Chen on the 12th of July 2018. On 13 March 2020, the charges against SP1 were dismissed by a magistrate. Now later, in October 2019, another Sunnyfield staff member subsequently raised a further complaint to Sunnyfield that SP2 had assaulted Melissa. And that had occurred either on the 29th of May 2019 or the 3rd of June 2019. Sunnyfield noticed, notified the Quality and Safeguards Commission and the New South Wales Police. This resulted in SP2 being charged with assaulting Melissa. The charges were laid on 22 January 2020. The matter proceeded to court and on the 17th of August 2020, those charges were dismissed. Returning now to Sunnyfield's investigation, Ms Piord prepared a number of reports with respect to her investigations concerning the treatment of Chen, Carl and Melissa. But she also investigated issues with respect to SP1's recruitment. Commissioner Ms Piod will give evidence tomorrow and as I mentioned earlier, she will tell you about her reports and findings. Following her investigations, not all of the allegations of physical abuse or mistreatment of the residents were substantiated. However, Ms Piod found that six of the 25 allegations concerning SP1's treatment of Carl and Chen were sustained. Two of the 25 allegations concerning SP1's treatment of Carl and Chen were partially sustained. And 17 of the 20 allegations concerning SP2's treatment of Carl and Chen were sustained. Ms P had also identified some more systemic issues. She said Carl and Chen's parents lacked trust in the staff at the house. And this manifested in the parents needing to continually check up on staff and processes. Ms P had warned that this type of culture can either lead to non-reporting of incidents or misrepresenting reporting to cover up for another staff member. She found that the staff at the house felt bullied by SP1. She found the staff were segregated based on ethnicity. She found the culture in the house had become, quote, disjointed and distrusting. She said there was a lack of understanding about the importance of reporting. She, th she said there was a mixed understanding among the staff about what constituted abuse, assault and neglect. With respect to Melissa, Melissa Ms Piod conducted two investigations in September 2019 in relation to unexplained injuries to Melissa that had occurred on the 14th of August 2019. A second allegation was uh, that SP2 had dragged Melissa by the wrists and that had occurred, as I said earlier, on May the 29th or the 3rd of June 2019. 
Ms Piord investigated aspects of how SP1 was recruited to work for Sunnyfield in 2017. She examined SP1's employment history and whether he had worked at a particular organisation prior to commencing work at Sunnyfield. Ms Piord found SP1's employment history displayed significant breaks in employment continuity, which appeared not to have been followed up. She expressed concern that SP1 had twice refused to answer her question as to whether he'd worked for a particular previous service organisation, and that organisation had not been listed in SP1's resume that had been provided by him to Sunnyfield at the time of recruitment. However, on 7 January 2019, information had been disclosed to the New South Wales Ombudsman um, in turn to the Office of the Children's Guardian pursuing... Sorry, I'll withdraw that. I've missed a page. My apologies. Can I walk back? I'll come back to the recruitment. Commissioners, Paul Miller, the New South Wales Ombudsman, has provided two statements to the Royal Commission. Mr Miller has declined the Royal Commission's request to give oral evidence at this public hearing and he asserts he cannot be compelled to give evidence. We keep our invitation open to him, but you have the benefit of his statements. In his first statement, he explains that during March 2018, the Ombudsman was conducting an inquiry into probity checks and recruitment practices of accommodation service providers when obtaining staff from labour hire agencies. The Ombudsman examined a number of notifications about SP1 in his previous employment unrelated to and well before his employment with Sunnyfield. This included an allegation in uh, 2005 of alleged sexual misconduct towards a 17-year-old girl in residential care, which was found to have been unsubstantiated for lack of evidence. It also included a notification in October 2016 in relation to supervisory neglect of a person with disability, falsifying documents including timesheets and falsifying a client's medication chart and other misconduct. As a result of a finding of misconduct, SP1 was dismissed on 30 November 2016 by a service provider. In September 2018, the Ombudsman's Office prepared a draft letter to Sunnyfield seeking information about Sunnyfield's recruitment and probity policies. The draft letter set out the October 2016 notification about SP1. This letter was not sent to Sunnyfield and Mr Miller says it's apparent from the Ombudsman's record that the letter was never sent. I'll come back to where I got up to. However, on 7 January 2019, this information was disclosed by the New South Wales Ombudsman to the New South Wales Office of the Children's Guardian pursuant to a specific statutory provision that permitted the New South Wales Ombudsman to make a disclosure to the Children's Guardian. Until these proceedings, Sunnyfield has been unaware that the Ombudsman had this information about SP1. Coming back to what happened to SP1 and SP2. On the 9th of December 2019, Sunnyfield terminated SP1's employment. On the 21st of January 2020, Sunnyfield terminated SP2's employment. Ms Cudahy will tell you the events that occurred at the House, and in particular those concerning the actions of SP1 and SP2, have caused considerable hurt and distress to the residents of the House, their families, to the staff and to all Sunnyfield staff involved in the matter. In her statement, she says this. 
I wish to express my regret and deep sympathy for the pain and distress suffered as a consequence of the events which occurred at the House. In the course of preparing this statement, I have spoken to a number of staff about the events at the House. All of those staff have communicated to me their upset at the thought that the residents at Sunnyfield have been mistreated in this way. I feel the same way. The families will tell you that they've not received an apology and they've not received any redress in relation to these events. A key question for this inquiry is how and why these events could have happened. And we propose to examine a range of matters including issues arising when Sunnyfield took over the House in May 2017. The pre-employment screening and recruitment of support workers, particularly SP1 and SP2. How Sunnyfield supervised its support staff. For example, in an email, SP1 described his stress levels as, quote, going through the roof in September 2017. This may have been an important red flag. We will examine how Sunnyfield's policies worked on a practical level for the day-to-day -day operation and management of the house. How residents, families and other support staff could identify red flags and escalate them to senior managers and Sunnyfield's response team. How family members could raise their concerns without having to escalate those concerns to the level of a formal complaint and whether their concerns were always addressed and treated seriously. I propose to examine how Sunnyfield supported Melissa, Carl, Chen and their families during the PIOD investigations, police investigations and the criminal proceedings. I want to examine whether Sunnyfield accepts that it should be accountable for the events that occurred at the home and consider whether pointing a finger at so-called querulant complainants is an approach that is appropriate in the circumstances. We will examine why Sunnyfield has not apologised for the violence and abuse to the residents or offered any redress to the residents and their families. Propose, propose to examine how NDIS funded services and supports were identified and then provided to the residents and how agreements for accommodation and support services from Sunnyfield operated, including how Sunnyfield allocated its funding internally to ensure the appropriate contemplated supports were utilised for Melissa, Carl and Chen. Sunnyfield will tell you during the course of this week about the changes and improvements that have been made since these events. We will examine the changes and improvements to understand whether and how those measures will adequately protect Melissa, Carl and Chen from violence and abuse in their own home. We will also examine the role and responsibility of the New South Wales Ombudsman, the NDIA, and the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission with respect to the various complaints made about the treatment of residents. And I'll a pause in saying that we do not propose to go complaint by complaint and to analyse each complaint in detail, but what we seek to do is to have an understanding of what people should expect when they lodge complaints with these various organisations. We will also examine what each of the New South Wales Ombudsman, NDIA and Quality and Safeguards Commission did to support the residents and discharge any regulatory function with respect to Sunnyfield. And overall, we want to ask whether the safeguards that should have been in place worked or were they effective to prevent or respond to incidents of violence and abuse. Commissioners, after considering the evidence, it may be open to you to make findings about Sunnyfield's failure to ensure Melissa, Carl and Chen 
were not protected from violence and abuse in their own home. You may also identify further areas from in for inquiry that may point to systemic issues in the delivery of service supports and accommodation that be, can be considered in future hearings. I think, uh, Ms Eastman, there may have been an errant not in uh, one of your sentences. I think you meant to say that it may be open to make findings about uh, Sunnyfield's failure to ensure the residents uh, were, were protected. protected. I apologise for that. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Commissioners, you are committed to ensuring the conduct of this hearing is fair and Sunnyfield should have the opportunity to be heard and respond to the issues we examine also the rel relevant regulatory agencies. And you will make directions at the conclusion of this hearing as to how you wish council assisting to prepare any written or oral submissions with respect to proposed findings and the opportunity for the parties with leave to respond to those findings. The Royal Commission has received extensive documentary records in the course of the preparation for this hearing and some of these records will be discussed during the hearing. However, the formal tendering of documents into evidence will be done following the conclusion of the oral presentation of the evidence in order to permit consideration of which documents need to be tendered, any redactions that may need to be made in order to protect the identities of the residents of the house or to address any other concerns raised by the parties and this will need to be done before the documents are released publicly. So finally, I remind those following the proceedings that there are provisions in the Royal Commissions Act which have the clear object of protecting witnesses who give evidence before the Royal Commission. In particular, I draw attention to Section 6, capital M of the Act, which provides any person who uses, causes or inflicts any violence, punishment, damage, loss or disadvantage to any person on account of the person having appeared as a witness before the Royal Commission or given evidence before the Royal Commission or producing documents to the Royal Commission commits an indictable offence. The maximum penalty for committing such offence is imprisonment. Commission pleases. Thank you, Ms Eastman. Um, arising out of Ms Eastman's uh Opening, just, I just have a couple of questions. Ms Downs, I just want to be clear, do you represent the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission? Yes, Chair. So that is part of uh, your appearance today, Commonwealth, together with the NDIS uh, QFC. Thank you. Ms Furness, I understand that you announced an appearance for the New South Wales Ombudsman. Uh, and according to the opening, the Ombudsman uh, takes the view that uh, he is not compellable as a witness before this Royal Commission. Is, is that right? Yes. Could you help me by explaining how that works for the purposes of this Royal Commission in the light of the provisions in the Royal Commissions Act? That is the Commonwealth Royal Commissions Act? Uh, the New South Wales Ombudsman takes the view that Section 35.1, which is that the Ombudsman shall not nor shall an officer of the Ombudsman, who is not a member of the police force, be competent or compellable to give evidence or produce any document in any legal proceedings in respect of any information obtained by the Ombudsman or officer in the course of his functions. He takes the view that legal proceedings incorporates proceedings before this Royal Commission. What's the foundation for that view? Uh, his foundation is the section I have read. Sorry? His foundation is the section I have just read. A Royal Commission is a legal proceeding for the purposes of uh, that section? Yes, Madam Chair. Is there any authority that establishes that proposition? Uh, it is his view based on his construction of the legislation. I don't doubt it's his view, but I'm not sure that's the question I asked. <coughs> uh, Chair, if you wish to uh, have a discussion with me as to the legal basis, um, I would want to take that on notice and if you wish submissions by the Ombudsman as to his view then if that is the case I'll need to take that on notice. If you would be good enough to do that I'm not sure what the position might be but I rather judge from council assisting's opening that we might be invited to make a finding in relation to the Ombudsman and I'm just wondering about what role the Ombudsman is going to take in these proceedings. 
Perhaps taking that on notice, you might also consider what the interaction is between a provision in state legislation, Section 35 of the Ombudsman Act, and uh, the relevant provisions of the Royal Commissions Act, which is a Commonwealth Act, and one might think prevailed over any inconsistent state act. But I'll leave that with you should the issue arise later on. Thank you. Ms Eastman, is it appropriate to take an adjournment now? Yes, if we can take an adjournment for half an hour. For how long? 30 minutes. Yes, all right. Well, we'll adjourn <laughs> until uh, it's now nearly 11.30. We'll adjourn until 12 noon. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is resumed. Yes, Ms. Eastman. Uh, Commissioners, the first witness to be called uh, uses the pseudonym Eliza, and there are a few corrections to Eliza's statement, and I might deal with them first before we uh, take uh, Eliza's evidence, if that's convenient. Yes, by all means. So, Commissioners, the corrections start at paragraph 39. Yes. The date of August 2017 should be September 2017. Yes. And in that first sentence, Eliza said, I had a tele teleconference with the Sunnyfield CEO and company secretary. Uh, it's just the Sunnyfield company secretary. So delete CEO and. Yes, thank you. Next correction is at paragraph 131. And you'll see that there is a chronology that Eliza has prepared. And for the entry that says 2015, <coughs> and she says, I was granted guardianship, that should read, I started the application for guardianship. And guardianship was granted in February 2016. Thank you. So uh, Eliza now will take her oath or affirmation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence. Uh, if you would be good enough to follow the instructions to take the affirmation. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation at the end. Please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Eliza. Now, um, Ms Eastman will ask you some questions. Now, you are using the pseudonym Eliza, but you've provided your full name to the Royal Commission. Yes. And you've also provided your address to the Royal Commission. Yes. And your occupation is work in emergency services. Yes. Now, sitting with you at the witness table today is your husband. Yes. And rather than give him a separate pseudonym, we'll just call him Eliza's husband. Okay. Uh, you have prepared a statement for the Royal Commission, and do you have a copy with you? Yes. And that statement was made on the 29th of April this year? Yes. And the statement includes some annexures? Yes. Have you got a copy of those with you? Yes. Now, Commissioners, the statement can be found in the Hearing Bundle Part A, Volume 1, behind Tab 2. And the annexures can be found in the same volume starting at tab eight. And they continue through to volume two to tab 35. Now, Eliza, you've heard uh, me make some corrections to your statement and you've provided those corrections earlier today. Yes. And with those corrections, is what you say in the statement true? Yes. Now, you are a legal guardian for your sister, who we will refer to as Melissa. Yep. 
And you want to tell the Royal Commission about the circumstances resulting in Melissa receiving a notice from Sunnyfield that Sunnyfield will terminate its accommodation and support services for Melissa with effect from 5 September 2018? Yes. And you also want to share some of Melissa's experience in supported accommodation and your observations of what you think might be systemic issues. Is that right? Yes. So this is about Melissa. Can we start with Melissa? Yep. And I can see a big smile on your face as you say that. Oh, she's so funny. I, I really wish you guys could see her, like, in her element, because she's adorable. Yeah. She's 23 years old. Yep. And uh, she's bubbly and she's got a great sense of humour. She does. And I'm going to have to ask you to say yes rather than not. Sorry, I yes. Uh, yep. <clears throat> so I need you just to, um, you can nod, but also. Yes, answer. yes. And when you and Melissa were growing up together, uh, you were the practical jokers of the family and you played a lot of practical jokes, is that right? Yes. And Melissa can be very cheeky. Yes. And she makes people laugh. Yes, she does. She's honest. Mm -hmm. Yes. She's authentic. Yes. And you know when she's happy because she beams the happiness. Is that right? Yes. She can be very affectionate. Yes. And she loves patting and feeding and caring for animals. Yes. And she shows no fear around animals. Yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible to watch. Now, uh, whether this is something from you growing up together, but she loves anything from the 1990s with the ABC shows like Play School, Sesame Street and the original Wiggles. Is that right? Oh, yes. They've got to be – not the imposters. Got to be the originals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she knows. Now, um, people might ask, why can't Melissa be here giving evidence for herself today? And she would not – manage in this environment and that's not to silence her no but this is not an environment where you think she would feel comfortable giving and speaking for herself is that right that's right yeah and but you still wanted to make sure that the Royal Commission got a sense of her and there's some a very short video that you want to show the Royal Commission and this is Melissa speaking and we also have some photographs so can we start by playing a very short video and this is the connection with Sesame Street, is that right? Yes, okay. yeah. So that's my mother in the background and that's trying to get a rise out of her like she usually does. Okay. Oh. So there's some photographs of Melissa as well that um, you've chosen and you feel this will give the Royal Commission and people following the Royal Commission a little bit of a sense of who she is. So we'll put some of those photographs up and if you want to explain the photographs or say something about Melissa as they come up, feel free to do so. Yep, so this is Melissa. She loves um, feeding animals. And if there wasn't a fence there, she'd get right up in there. Um, yeah, she just like, had no fear and the animals sense it too. Um, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. She loves them. Going for a walk, loves to feed the ducks. She... Um, She's got a few to chase down there. She does, she does. And it's funny, when we used to do this as kids, she, you'd give us some bread and we go, all right, Melissa, this is stale bread for the ducks, right? And so she'll go, one for the duck and one for me. And we're like, no, no, Melissa, it's, it's, it's stale, it's stale. And she's like, it's stale for the ducks. And then you turn around for a second, you come back, and she's got her cheeks full like a little chipmunk <laughs> trying to get the, get the bread in. So, yeah, she, um, she loves doing that. I think there's one more. Yep, she, uh, that's not actually her bike, but, uh, yeah, she likes riding around on a bike. 
I want to ask you now about Melissa's disability and how her disabilities affect her day-to-day -day life. So when she was born, she was diagnosed with Prader-Willi syndrome. And do you want to explain, I mentioned that in the opening, but do you want to explain to the commissioners what the nature of the condition is and what it means for Melissa in terms of her day-to-day -day life? Sure. Um, so yeah, as you said in, um, earlier, um, <coughs> This chromosomal condition affects multiple body systems. Um, for her, it's resulted in intellectual disability <coughs> and impaired physical impairment. Not everyone with Prada Willi uh, has Just an intellectual... Just to jump in, and uh, I have to slow down this yep. as well, but can we slow down so the interpreters can keep up with us? Yep, yep. Um, so, as you mentioned before, the most notable thing about Prada Willie is that insatiable desire to eat. It doesn't matter if the food is off or spoiled or not even food. Um, she'll consume it to uh, fulfil that sense within her. Is that, that like taking the stale bread for the ducks? She wouldn't make a distinction between stale no. bread and fresh bread. No. It's she's, food. Yeah, it's yeah. food. And she's constantly hungry all the time. Mm. Um, so it requires a lot of um, environmental and behavioural management control to um, enable her to live a life where that's not the predominant feeling. Um, so along with that, though, um, <clears throat> so we mentioned we're not entirely sure that she experiences disgust either because, you know, we've seen her do things like um, she once got into the stock powder and she, before you could go, no, she's there with the spoon and you see it on her face. It was like, can you imagine eating a spoonful of salt? It's not nice, but she was determined to charge through it. Um, you know, same with flour. She's tried doing that too and she just, yeah, um, she needs a lot of protection from, from that because she can't help it. Um, what about uh, any impact on her behaviour? She also has a diagnosis of autism yeah. and PTSD. Yes. How does that impact in terms of her behaviour? Well, <clears throat> it's sort of, they're all intermingled in the sense that we've got autism, we've got global de developmental delay, we've got these obsessive behaviours, um, you know, the trauma of obviously living in a, a home environment where there was domestic violence and conflict and multiple crisis situations, um, you know, and then entering into group home life, which in by its very nature is traumatic. You have a lot of people come in and out of her life. Um, you know, um, she's only got her, like her mother, myself and her other sister that are around for her. So um, in terms of how it manifests in her behaviour, because she's got difficulties with her communication, um, she can injure herself. And just to finish the note on the communication, her interpretive uh, ability to understand is a lot better than her ability to express herself. So often um, she has learnt to, whilst in care, to display some behaviours that help her get what she wants or get her message across. So these can include headbanging, hitting herself. Um, the skin picking is a, is a feature of Prada Willie. Um, she doesn't sleep well overnight. That is also a feature of Prada Willie in that her hormone centres are underdeveloped. So she's got, she's short, she's small, she never received growth hormone. So um, she's also osteoporotic um, from that and she doesn't receive those hormones um, overnight as well that help her remain asleep. So she's up often and that plays into her self-interest behaviour as well because we've got, so I touched on head banging, hitting herself. Um, you know, often she's, it's very loud when she is um, dysregulated. 
So um, that can be in itself can be very confronting because she'll scream and cry and she you can mm -hmm. see it all over her face like she is distressed. Mm -hmm. And when you're like when if you were to film it right and you were to watch it with the sound off, it's a different experience to when you're you're living it and you're facing it and she's doing it right in front of you. And um, you know there's other associated behaviours in terms of you know, stripping, um, fecal smearing. Um, she's incontinent, so she wears um, a pad. And I, I say all this to sort of highlight the challenges of her condition as it relates to what it means to look after her. So is, is it the case that, as you've said in your statement, it takes somebody who's suitably skilled, who knows her, takes the time to understand her to be able to communicate with her properly? Yes. It takes a long time. Even for professionals, it can take up to a year for them to really understand what she's about and what she says, um, to be across her history as well, which is really complicated. Um, yeah, it takes them a long time. All right. Yeah. Now, I want to move to her experiences in residential care. And can I start with when you had to abandon her. And I know that's a very difficult time in the family's life. So you'd finished high school and you'd left home. Yep. And uh, Melissa was living with your mother. Yes. And your mum became overwhelmed and you could see a crisis developing. Yes. You realised at that time that Melissa couldn't continue to live with your mum. Yes. And you could only get Melissa into full-time residential care if you, what you've said in your statement, legally abandoned her yep. at a respite service. And you did this in 2011. What happened then? Yeah, so at the time, um, Mum was receiving uh, negligible respite services um, from a temporary respite accommodation house near her. And um, mum at the same time, you know, was, she had some um, health conditions that, that was developing. <laughs> oh, Melissa, sorry. Um, Melissa um, also had some really traumatic experiences at her school for two years prior to leading up to this crisis situation. That it, what that included, being kept in a <laughs> cage, did it? Yeah, so, so just to put a bit of background to the family dynamic, so... Um, her dad's not in the picture. Uh, we have separate fathers. So um, I am basically the mother of my household since I was about 14. Um, That's a pretty big burden. It is. It, it's huge. And not many people understand. Um, I think at the time when we were trying to figure out a safe situation for Melissa and mum, we went to facts like, this is serious, like you guys need to give us some help because we are talking life and death here. And um, they said, oh, maybe we can get you a couple more hours on a Sunday. I'm like, oh, you guys don't understand. Mum is here every, every day, every day. Um, and, I, and I feel bad saying this because I'm trying to be really respectful of um, <laughs> dignity, uh, Melissa's dignity. Um, but it was, it's very, because she doesn't sleep, we needed to have locks everywhere and locks on a room because we've had situations where she will, she's climbed out windows um, and fallen two metres and been found roaming the yard naked at four o'clock in the morning. And so um, poor mum was trying to deal with that and then she wakes up and finds that because she was left alone and she was bored in this room, um, she was sick of her toys, she'd pull apart the contents of nappy and smear it. And mum was, there's only so many times that you can scrub, you know, what out of the carpet. Before. So, the, so this is the sort of crisis yeah. that the family was seeking. That's and so what, so legally abandoning basically meant leaving Melissa yeah. at the respite service, is that right? Yes, yeah, so basically we were told there's no voluntary um, out of home care. Um, so you have to legally not tell the 
respite house. I'm sorry, but we're not picking her up because it's not safe for her to come home. And but we we cried many tears over it um, because that doesn't take away from how much we love. You love her very much, and so does Mum. And, and you've held you've held this trauma of having to make that decision. Yep. Which meant Melissa left the family and then went to live in residential disability care, and that's. Yep where she's been for almost 10 years, is that right? Yes, and like you asked me a question before, I don't feel like I completely answered because I think it's relevant here. When she was at a school, so leading up to this time, the two years, it was like brewing before this crisis. The teachers at her special school said to me during a parent-teacher uh, interview that um, she's psychotic, she needs to be on more meds. So... Being a young person myself, no idea, went, OK, we'll take her to the doctor. And the doctor said, no, it sounds like a behavioural management issue at the school. Refer back. So we referred back, but insisted, no, she needs to be sedated. Went, OK. Um, well, when this has happened previously, you guys maybe took some footage. Could you take some footage of what you're talking about? We'll take it to the paediatrician. And, you know, we offered As Aspect to come in and, you know, because they, they denied that because they didn't want to. Um, I think the excuse was... We don't want to impact on other people's privacy. Um, I said, well, I'm not asking about other people, I'm asking about her, and only the doctor's going to see it. What are you concerned about? No, nope, Stonewall, not going to happen. Then um, we said, well, what about Aspect come in? No, 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 the school wanted to do it themselves. So it, it was this stonewall of, like, you just couldn't do anything. And then the behaviours started ramping up at home and at her respite. And we went, something's going on here. And then one day a DVD came home from this school and it was a 20-minute montage of her being kept in a cage. And, you, like, we're talking... So someone who is headbanging kept in a bag room with the bag hooks at head and eye level and it didn't show any clinical... There was no clinical benefit to be drawn from this footage. There was no antecedent. There was no consequence. It was just her behaviour. And it highlighted what this school and these particular teachers did to her when she was struggling, when she was finding it hard to communicate, <laughs> and they, they kept her in caged areas between a basketball court and a shed where they kept chickens. And there's footage of her, this beautiful little girl, screaming while she's watching all the other kids play cricket. These experiences yep. early in Melissa's life and yep. development mm. mean that you are ferociously <laughs> protective of her. A hundred percent I am because I can't and I won't watch her go through that again mm. and I apologise to everyone here for my emotion okay. because, because so much of this and what I've experienced with group homes because yes yeah, she's been She's been in group home for 10 years. Yeah. So what, I want to come and ask you yeah. some of those questions. Yeah. But uh, for you, coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence has been very difficult, but you want to speak and be Melissa's voice so the Royal Commissioners can understand some of the issues that have arisen. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And you're probably telling people in this room and following the broadcast, things about your family and yourself. Yep. And why you're so protective that people may not know about you. Is that yep. right? Yep. Because you're also a private, you want to be professional and yep. uh, thorough in discharging your duties yep. as Melissa's guardian. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And preparing for this hearing meant that you've had to read some material and also reflect on these past events. Yeah. And they 
they churn up, don't they? Oh, yeah. Like, it is a constant state of anxiety for worrying about her and it, because, yeah, there's limits to what I can physically do for her and it's been a real tough road of having to accept... Um, having to accept a lot of things that I wish were different for her. Yeah. And one, one of the real concerns that you've got before we start looking at <clears throat> the relationship with Sunnyfield is this precarious situation that Melissa's presently in and you do not want you speaking to the Royal Commission to result in any harm or disadvantage to Melissa at all. Yeah. And that's a real fear oh, about yeah. giving evidence, isn't it? Yes, because I've... I've felt like this before when I went to the Ombo and cut me off if I'm going to get off track. But I said to them, if I complain to you, they're going to, they're going to retaliate. And the Ombo said, no, they can't. It's in the legislation here. Uh, it's illegal. They're not allowed to do it. And then after everything that happened, I went, well, okay, so are you guys going to step in now? And they said, well, it's not clear to us that what they've done is retaliation. I said, I'm sorry. Are they supposed to give you a letter that says we're we're doing this in retaliation? Okay. So, just, so is it fair to say that even with the royal commission, you haven't got the highest trust in government agencies? Oh. Would that be a fair comment? Oh, fair. Yeah, I, I think the uh, the ombudsman um, have made an example of that in not being here today. All right. Okay. Well, let let's turn to your statement. So you've got a copy of your statement there and we might come back to that. Eliza, and so I just interrupt? So if you need a break at any time, just tell us and we'll have a break. Thank okay? you very much. Thank you. So Commissioners, I thought we might go to one o'clock and so if Eliza can bear with us for yep. the next 33 minutes, but if you, of course if you need a break before we can. So uh, around early 2016, and I'm at paragraph 15 of your statement, Melissa and some other residents moved into a purpose-built house in Western Sydney and all of the residents of this house have high support needs and you're going to refer to two of them in your statement, Carl and Chen, and the three of them live together now at the house. Is that right? Yes. Now, when the NDIS was introduced, you and the other families got together and decided that... The, that your family members wanted to exercise choice and control. Yes. And they wanted to consider a new service provider for the house. Is that right? Yes. And uh, with the arrival of the NDIS in New South Wales, Melissa had an NDIS plan, and that included funding for support coordination, core supports, transport, assistive technology, as well as various allied health professionals, including behavioural intervention uh, yes. support. Is that right? Yes. And you've provided a copy of the plan in the material that you've given to the Royal Commission. And commissioners, the plan can be found at tab 16 in volume A. Now, I won't take you to that document, but the plan sets out what Melissa's goals are in terms of living an independent life. Yep. And the plan makes it fairly clear that there are two important goals for her. One is connection with her family and the opportunity to develop independence so she can engage with the family. Is that right? Yes. And the second is participation in the community. So one of the objects, and I'm paraphrasing here, yes. is that she develops skills that will enable her to have community participation to the best of her ability. Yes. And the idea behind setting goals is that the supports that are funded for Melissa will help her reach those goals. Yes. So the supports are more than just simply providing the bricks and mortar and somebody to make your breakfast, lunch and dinner. It's really about assisting a person to live a life with dignity. Yeah, yeah. Now, when uh, the families got together and were looking at prospective service providers, yep. Sunnyfield became the service provider that you thought at the time would probably be best suited for the residents in the house. Yes. 
And at that time, you were not just looking for Melissa, but the families together were saying for the then four residents of the house, what services did they need collectively and individually? Is that right? Yes. Yep. And so uh, towards the latter part of 2016, the families had some uh, engagement with Sunnyfield. You got some brochures and documents from Sunnyfield about their services and how yep. they operated. Yep. Now, you are a person, if you're given a document, you'll read it. Is that right? <laughs> yes. And if you've got a question about a document, you'll ask the question. Oh, yes. And so when uh, you got the documents from Sunnyfield, do you remember reading the Shared Living Operations Manual? Yes. And so you read that, what, cover to cover? Cover to cover. And you write all your notes on it? Sure did. Something like that. You worked yep. out what questions you wanted to ask. Yes. Okay. And so at that stage, you, you asked lots of questions of the business development development manager and the client engagement manager. I'm looking at paragraph 20 of your statement. And yep. uh, they were uh, receptive in the sense that they answered your queries and concerns. So yes. no one ignored you at that stage. No, it was a very rosy picture. It was exactly what we were looking for. And you believed that uh, Sunnyfield were open to finding creative solutions to particular issues. Yes. And you thought that this would be an organisation that would meet Melissa's very specific needs. Yes. And you were also looking for a sort of fresh start, weren't you, in a way of saying, Melissa has lived with this trauma. Mm. And you wanted, through the NDIS, to be a fresh start for her. Yeah. And, I, and we, were, we came to Sunnyfield with a very clear view about where we'd been with the previous service provider and I was intent on ensuring that the issues that we'd had with the previous service provider were not repeated again. Okay. Now, Sunnyfield, um, as a result of entering into some great agreements, and I want to take you to some of those in a moment, yep. took over the operation of the house on the 1st of May 2017. Yes. And I think Ms Cudahy in her statement says, you know, it was a pretty big day. The previous service providers were out the door. They didn't leave much by way of files or information. She yep. says in her statement the house was in a lot of disrepair. And so the commissioners will hear from the... Uh, from Sunnyfield about the condition of the house and some of the difficulties that Sunnyfield experienced in taking over the house. Yeah. But I want to ask you from your perspective about your expectations as to what was going to happen. Right. So Sunnyfield um, sent you an email and commissioners, and if you've got those volumes there, yep. if we go to tab 13... <clears throat> You received from Sunnyfield a copy of this service support agreement. Yeah. And commissioners, you may have a copy of this with you. And this came to you by email, is that right? Yes. And you understood that this was going to be an agreement that set out what Sunnyfield would deliver by way of services? and yeah. what your responsibilities would be, and also Melissa's responsibilities. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Now, I take it that you read this document carefully. Yes. And the commissioners will see in the material that you had some changes you wanted to make to the document. Yes. I'll come to that in a moment. But let's just have a look at the document first. Yep. And I want you to turn to the page which at the top of the page has the last four numbers, dot 0265, and it's page three of four of this document. And it has in the middle of the page a number six, responsibilities of Sunnyfield. Ms Eastman, do you want this brought up on the... No, I, I, look, I, I don't, um, Chair. I think it may be easier not to put this up on the screen. And what I'll do is make sure that I've identified those parts of the document for people Thank following. You. All right, so paragraph six sets out what Sunnyfield agrees to do. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of matters that are, are set out there. 
And the first one is to treat the participant, that's Melissa, and the participant's representative, that's you, with courtesy and respect and communicate openly and honestly in a timely manner. When you read this document, was that an important uh, matter for you? Yes, that's why I tried to get them specifically to tell me, what do you mean by timely matter? Okay. So what that was one of the that? issues yeah. you wanted to clarify? Yes. The second is that Sunnyfield agrees to consult with Melissa and with you where practical on decisions about how supports are provided and, once agreed, provide supports that meet Melissa's needs and Melissa's preferred times. Was that an important matter for you? Oh, yeah. Yes, it was. Now, I won't go through all of them, but there's a range of uh, matters as to what Sunnyfield agreed to do in the provision of services. Yes. And is it fair to say that looking at the whole of paragraph six, you were particularly interested in what Sunnyfield would do, but also how it would deliver those services. That's right. And one of the issues for you in reading this document was that because you live in a regional town away from Sydney, you had to find a way of making sure that you're aware of what was going on, that you were involved in the decision making, but that you could trust those entrusted with the day-to-day -day care of Melissa, Yes, that things would work. Yeah, it was partly that, and it's partly also setting my expectations from the outset, okay. because, um, you know, I don't expect someone to work to my timeline if it's um, not practical for them to do so, so I'll invite them. You tell me what I can expect. And these documents outlined what I was expecting, and I tried to tie these general principles in with the specific how, how to specifics that were illustrated to me in the other documents provided, such as the operations manual, because that laid out specific ways, for example, that they would sanitise objects, that they would prepare meals, that they would basically, how they would, like you said, how they would actually do this in practice. And the reason why I, I tried to get it in an agreement was that there could be no arguments of, oh, no, we can't do that, or no, no, our service doesn't provide that, because we'd had it, again, agreed in writing beforehand to minimise arguments. Okay. Now, you, also, you would have seen in this agreement at paragraph seven, it's the bottom of the page and over the page, yes. that, that Melissa or you would agree to a number of things, and that is to treat Sunnyfield with courtesy and respect. Yes. That you would tell Sunnyfield about how you would wish the supports to be delivered and to meet Melissa's needs, including any limits to funding that may be available. Yes. And you understood your responsibilities in that regard. Absolutely. That you would talk to Sunnyfield if Melissa or you had any concerns about the supports being provided. Yes. Now, did that give you some comfort that your obligation under this agreement was to talk to Sunnyfield about any concerns? Definitely. And there were a range of other things that were required. Now, both Sunnyfield and you would have to give notice if Melissa wanted to end the agreement. And paragraph 11, if you can turn over to the next page, sets out ending the agreement. Yes. <clears throat> this provided that either party may end this agreement by giving at least three months' notice in writing at any time or by giving 14 days' notice in writing if the other party seriously breaches this agreement. Did you read that clause at the time you signed this agreement? I did. Um but I didn't understand the gravity of the part about the supports being able to be withdrawn for no reason. I, because it was unfathomable to be that anyone would even do that. Um, Wait, sorry to interrupt. When you say for no reason, yes, are you saying that reading paragraph eleven, yes, it doesn't set out. 
the grounds or the reasons why an agreement might be ended yes. on three months' notice? Yes, I was not aware because, again, I couldn't imagine anyone making someone like that, like Melissa, homeless. I just, it never crossed my mind that someone would do that. Right. There, and, and this become, and we'll come to what happened on the 4th of yep. June 2018 shortly. Yep. But I'm just back in oh, sorry, 2016, yeah. early yep. part of 2017, when you're starting to have, you, I mean, you're starting out with Sunnyfield here. Yes. So you read this, but yes. you, but now you realise it didn't set out any agreements. That's right. Uh, any and reasons for why the termination of the, the agreement would be made, is that right? That's right. And the other thing I think is relevant here, and again, cut me off if you think I'm going off track. I here. will. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're given 2.5 days to sign this. And it was, if you don't sign it, there will no, be no one in the house to look after these guys. I didn't have time to get a lawyer or the IDRS to go and, and explain everything to me. Like, I'm just a pleb. I've got no, like, special training in, in disability um, services. Um, so I raised my concerns at the time and in writing to them that, hey, this is under duress here in signing this agreement because the other factor was... So when we were making these inquiries together with all the families, we were doing it covertly um, behind the other providers back because we didn't want them to retaliate and we wanted to be sure before we made the announcement. Um, and then because I think the timing of the NDIS um, rollout facts basically said, you need to make a decision now. And we weren't entirely ready we hadn't had any of this. We're still in those for formative discussions. Um, and so we made a leap of faith um, at that time. And I know personally, um, I think I can refer to him by name. Let me just check. Yeah, so Dr Mark Clayton, he was, the, he was what I was pinning my hopes on. I would had several conversations with him and I'd, I had some... Um, a lot of trust in him from um, a mutual friend. Um, and so I had confidence that this, all this would be ironed out. All right, I'm going to interrupt yep. you there. Yep. So just to follow this through, mm. uh, if you turn in the bundle of material that you've got there in that folder behind uh, tab number 19, and... Uh, if you have a look at the second page, and the subject matter of this email is said to be your feedback and concerns, re Melissa, I'm using the pseudonyms there. And if you look at that email, you've set out, or what, sorry, what somebody has set out is a summary of your suggested changes and concerns. Yes. And marked up documents that you had prepared and what's on this page are the proposed amendments to the service support agreement, which we've just been looking at, yep. and another agreement which I'll briefly take you to, which is the shared residency, residency agreement. Mm. So these are the these were the amendments that you prepared, I think as you say, with very short notice that you wanted to see change. Now if you go to the first page of that email, yep. There is uh, an email from someone at Sunnyfield to you on the 12th of April 2017 at 9.24am. Does that help you identify? Yes. Yep. And you've made a reference to Dr Mark Clayton and he's part of the um, recipients of the email. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Now... Um, You'll see that the email from Sunnyfield says to you, and I'll re commissioners, I'll read this out because I won't put it up on the screen. Melissa, sorry, Eliza. First and foremost, Sunnyfield will always put the safety and well-being of clients above all else. As we are taking over an existing service and doing so in a very short time frame. It will take a bit 
to get all the Sunnyfield policies and procedures in place. However, client safety and wellbeing will not be compromised during this time. Sunnyfield operates shared living homes under the guidance of our Sunnyfield Group Home Manual, and these practices will be put in place at the house. Yes. New paragraph. We cannot amend the service agreements as these are legal documents that are standardised to ensure consistency in service delivery and expectations across Sunnyfield and in compliance with the NDIA's terms of business. That said, Sunnyfield does understand Eliza's issues and we are open to discussing possible solutions to them. I would suggest that our priority should be to get staff into the house and get the service running. I'm sure that, and there's a reference to Dr Clayton, would welcome Eliza and the other families to meet the staff and to see what we are setting up. We will separately work with Eliza over the next eight weeks to ensure that we resolve all of her concerns. And it's suggested that the email be forwarded to you. So you did receive that email, is that right? Yes. Uh, later that morning. It looks like it was sent about 14 minutes or so after the email was um, circulated internally. All right. Yes. So did you understand by that response is all of the proposed changes that you wanted to see in the service support agreement and the shared living residency agreement couldn't be made because they are legal documents with standardised terms. Had you ever heard that before? Um, in my discussions with the ombudsman, then we discussed that more because my understanding was in line with what the ombudsman um, concluded on that issue was that isn't that the whole point of the NDIS? Isn't that the whole point that we have these agreements so we can set out expectations at the very beginning? Um, you know, I, I, it was complete. It was a complete. Um, it was a shock to receive it because it was not as they advertised to me. It was. It was not the conversations that I had had, and I had several with the client engagement manager leading up to it indicated that everything I had spoken about and asked on uh, Melissa's behalf was um, was not a problem. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, no worries. So can I take you back to the document behind tab 13? And if you, I think we were on page that had paragraph 11, which is, it says page five of four. I'm not quite sure how that works, but if you go over the page to page six of four, and seven of four, you signed the agreement on behalf of Melissa and yourself on the same day you got that email. Is that right? Yes. Now, the final clause I want to take you to in this agreement is paragraph 13, which is called Feedback, Complaints and Disputes. And it says, Sunnyfield welcomes, values and responds to all feedback. If Eliza, or Melissa wishes to give Sunnyfield feedback or make a complaint about the provision of supports, they can talk to the service coordinator, which is referred to in an earlier clause, uh, or can provide feedback to the following address, which is feedback at sunnyfield.org.au. Yes. Now, you're also given an option that if you didn't want to talk to Sunnyfield or you were not satisfied with the response, then you could contact Stopline, Sunnyfield's independent whistleblower service, or the NDIA, and telephone numbers were provided. Okay. So that's the first agreement. Can I just... So just before you leave that, may I ask you just another question about that uh, agreement? If you wouldn't mind going to page four of four of the document you've got in front of you, and you will see subparagraph J, says that uh, the participant or the participant's representative, which is, of course, mm. uh, Melissa or you, must ensure that all Sunnyfield invoices are paid as and when they fall due 
and that adequate funds are available in each bank account from which any direct debit payment is due under this agreement. <clears throat> what was your understanding as to how payment would be made for the services that Melissa was to receive? Yeah, so there was um, a couple of things. So in addition to being her guardian, I'm also her financial manager. So I'm accountable to um, the trustee and guard, New South Wales trustee and guardian, complete an audit every year. Um, and when the NDIS rolled out, there was... Sorry, I'll slow down. Sorry. <laughs> um, when the NDIS rolled out, there was a lot of confusion around the division of payments and categories um, that seemed a little bit arbitrary to me at the time, to be honest. But um, one of the things that concerned me with the previous service provider was that um, there were a lot of discrepancies in um, the way that services were being charged. So by way of example, when I first became uh, Melissa's guardian, um, I was actually invited by the school to help her find a day program because they warned me that there wouldn't be many services available to her and she's rapidly approaching what they called the post-school cliff, where she was really well supported in that second school. Um, and then after that was due to finish, um, it like there would be nothing. So I realised when I was making extensive inquiries at the time that uh, Melissa, sorry, Melissa didn't have a behaviour support plan. Um, when I looked at the agreements my mum had signed, I noticed that there was a lot that the previous provider should have been doing, including having a behavioural support practitioner there. So there was that, and there was also um, a lot of ambiguity over how much support she would have. So this sort of all happened around the same time. Um, and I'm just explaining it because I did get involved a lot in the finances because whenever an issue arose with her behaviour, you could see that the staff were struggling because they just didn't have the people power to help her and to, to manage. You're talking about the previous service provider? Yes. So I um, got very interested in who's being paid what because I could see that for all the big blocks of money that people were being given, there wasn't the services actually being given to her. So at the time that I did these agreements with Sunnyfield, I was concerned about, I wanted to make sure that what they said they were providing, they were going to provide and actually provide. And there were other instances around <laughs> Melissa had been overcharged um, to the tune of thousands of dollars and no one audited it. No one picked up on it. I saw it and went, hang on a minute, these dates don't line up. And so by me, so there was a couple of different categories. You've got the payment that comes out of her disability support pension. So that goes for basically your board and lodgings. To Sunnyfield, we're talking about. Correct. Um, I think it's 75%, whatever is in my statement. Um, uh, it's a significant portion that goes all to Sunnyfield, and that's to cover food, the house, all the utilities. Um, so that's that part. And then the NDIS had several other categories. So there was a lot of confusion at the start because even the trustee and guardian didn't know how financial managers were supposed to set up their accounts in order to be financially accountable. So I ended up having to open a second bank account to keep the NDIS payments separate so I could keep track of where things were going. The other reason why I chose to get involved in the finances, particularly where it related to uh, s staff support, so um, community engagement, so that means the staff support between the hours of nine till three, Monday to Friday, 
um, clinical involvement was to have that choice and control to be able to, if we found someone or if there, we identified a need, so let's say Melissa's harness was broken and needed to be replaced ASAP, I could jump on it and get it done for her as soon as possible rather than wait several weeks or months because oh, let me tell you, the board probably already know, but um, it can take up to three months to get the ball rolling on something. So I wanted to have that flexibility to be able to, um, if we found a day program, bang, I could make it happen straight away. And the other thing was to keep an eye on if they're charging for one-to-one -one support or two-to-one support, to cross-reference that with what was being reported to me on the ground. So there was a lot of concern around money because at the end of the day, this is a business. Well, it's been run as a private business. But the sources of oh, yeah. funding that yes. you were using were yep. from the NDIS. Yep. And that was the source of the funding to be paid to Sunnyfield, is that right? Could yes. I, could I jump in there? And in, if you've still got the document behind tab 13 and you go to page 10 of 4, Schedule 2, which is described as NDIS supports. Which one? So we're behind uh, tab 13. So yep. we're still in the agreement that you signed. Yep. And it's got the last three the numbers last three, at the top yes. of the page of 272. Right at the top of the page. It's on the right hand corner. It's scheduled to NDIS supports. Have you got that? Uh, yep. Okay. And in item one, there's a, a breakdown of the supports to be provided. Yes. And there's various numbers. So assistance with daily life. Yep. Transport. Assistance with social and community participation. Yes. And all of those have a, a figure. Yes. And then uh, there's home modification, specialist disability accommodation, SDA, and that's to be confirmed. So for the amounts that are in there, that totaled $377,773.66 plus the SDA. And I'm not sure if that adding up deletes the 18,000 for improved relationships. All right, so we'd then have to take the 18,000 off. Yes. So in terms of the questions that the chair asked you about sources of funding, yes. that's one source in terms of NDIS funding. Okay. Yes. Right, step one. Step two yep. is the document behind tab 14 in the same bundle. If you turn to page 11 of 12, and just using the top numbers, it's dot zero two nine zero. There's Schedule 3, Direct Debit Authorisation. Yep. That's the bank account that, one of the bank accounts that you had for Melissa. Yes. And that set out a direct debit system to Sunnyfield for rental fee and home service fee. Do you see that? Yes. And that $562.95 comes from Melissa's disability support pension. Is that right? Yes. So while we're in the shared resident, sorry, shared living residency agreement, so this is the first page behind tab 14. This is the other agreement that uh, you signed and that set out Sunnyfield's obligations in relation to the provision of home services, that's meals and utilities. So if you look at page 3 of 12, That sets out Sunnyfield's obligations to provide Melissa with three meals a day, etc. Hmm. And that sets out the arrangements at paragraph four on the payment of fees. Hmm. And at paragraph five, it sets out responsibilities of Melissa or you. And that's the things that you had to provide for Melissa in the house. So you're responsible to provide all furniture, bed, clothing, linen, for residence, bedroom, and a few other things. And these are, again, terms that you wanted to negotiate and get some 
clarity about. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. I'm just a little bit confused. Just one second. Sorry. Sorry, so, I'm going a bit too quickly. Take your Oh, time. no, no, no. I just, uh, just want to, I need to cross-reference this because I know there was a time because it was a, a point of um, contention around um, the direct debit. There was a time where I insisted on being provided with the invoices first so I can ensure that services were delivered before they were paid. I always paid them on time and I insisted on email because our mail service is unreliable and I wanted to make sure that there was an easily identifiable record of when I was being provided with important documentation like this because an accusation was levelled that I didn't pay specific invoices, which is completely untrue. Um, so uh, it was much later that I sort of had seen how Sunnyfield Billing Department had operated long enough to sort of have the trust that um, they would, their, their system would just take care of it and I didn't need to be all over it. Uh, but it also, I was con there was also some confusion again at the time because no one really knew how to manage the NGOS. The transport funding gets sucked up through that invoice. And so it was a real, I had to like take from one account a little bit here, a little bit there to pay the one invoice. I've since worked out a way to have it automatic so I don't need to be manually handling it all the time. And then I just review it come the end of the year and I'll check that they line up with the dates. And so, yeah, because I remember crossing something out at one point going, mm, yeah, I might not do that because, again, like I've been in situations where, well, even with Sunnyfield, um, when I was keeping an eye on all the money, because now it's sort of changed and I'm preparing to go back to work full time, so I'm not going to have the time to do all this anyway. And I've, we've gotten to know each other a, a bit and it's mm, the least of my concerns. So um, I'm happy to let it go because I go, look, on the balance of things, there's not much I can really impact. So it's not a hill to die on, let it go. But, you know, I have picked up when they've either undercharged or they've overcharged and the rough amount was about $5,000. All right, so what, uh, commissioners, I'm conscious of the time and what we might do if that's convenient to break now, and I've got a few more questions about this agreement and the quote for services, and then we'll turn to some of the events leading to Melissa's uh, eviction, uh, in effect uh, eviction notice. So would that be a convenient time to adjourn? Liza, we'll, we'll take a break now for an hour for lunch. We'll resume at 2 o'clock, if that's OK. Yeah. And uh, so that's when we'll start again. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Yes, all right, well, we'll adjourn now. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is resumed. Yes, Ms. Eastman. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Uh, there's a bit of an echo here. I don't know if that sounds working for law and order. I'll, I'll press on, but I think you can hear there's a bit what, of an what, echo. What's, what's there's the an problem? echo in the... Echo. Oh. Uh, we were, uh, Eliza, before lunch, we were on the agreement described as shared living residency agreement at tab 14. Yes. So can I take you back to that document? Yes. And we had covered the responsibilities mm -hmm. of the resident or the resident's representative, that's Melissa and you. And then uh, I wanted to ask you about paragraph six. And you'll see it starts at the bottom of the page and then to the top of the page that Melissa and you acknowledge that Sunnyfield, in its capacity as accommodation provider, may require that there be a single service support provider engaged by all residents of the house to provide them with shared living supports. Yes. So Melissa and you acknowledge that this service support provider may also be Sunnyfield, subject to Sunnyfield complying with any requirements of the NDIA in relation to separation of functions and management of conflicts of interest as between accommodation providers and service support providers. All right. Did you understand what that meant? Um. 
The, I feel like there's two parts to this. Yes. One is that they may require there to be a single service support provider engaged by all residents in the house in order to do the job. So in other words, you can't have two companies providing support. All right, so say, just pausing there, say for example, that you identified somebody to provide the particular uh, supports for Melissa and you said, this is a really good provider. Yep. And Carl's parents said, actually, we've got a different company and we think that's going to be a really good provider. It was your understanding that instead of having different providers coming into the house that was otherwise operated by Sunnyfield, that the effect of this is that Sunnyfield would have one provider for all residents in the house? I didn't think about it too deeply at the time because, again, this, the circumstances that unfolded were just inconceivable to me at that time. Um, I know that during trying to negotiate around the eviction of, all right, well, if you can't kick her out, like you might be able to stop your service, but you can't kick her out of the house because she hasn't breached the this agreement. Um, we suggested as an act of desperation, um, well, would you be open to having someone else come in? Now, we knew on a practical level that would be extremely difficult to actually do, but we threw it out there because, you know, we were just... We can't have her in a situation where she doesn't have a home that supports her. So that's on point one. The second point around the conflict of interest. Now, this is something that that's probably the latter part I was really paying attention to. Well, what did what was your understanding of what this so, term in the agreement actually meant? So again, I'm a layperson. I've got no legal knowledge. But my understanding of conflict of interest was um, one company can't do both things. So you have to have a separate entity. When I tried to investigate, hang on, they get, they've got the house and the service supports, how can this be? The answer to me at the time, I can't remember if it was facts that was telling me I or the NDI. Can you slow oh, sorry. down a, a little bit? Sorry, sorry, where do I need to start off again? Uh, at the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm so sorry. So at the time, I think you said facts. So I think we were up to that. Yeah, so at the time, Facts or the NDIA, I can't remember which, said to me that the distinction between the, um, well, the definition of a conflict of interest in this particular context with this issue, i.e. service and accommodation agreements, uh, was blurred and it wasn't entirely clear. All I knew is I did every. I made every effort to ensure that Sunnyfield only had the service and not the accommodation, because, well, the situation we all found ourselves in prior to engaging Sunnyfield was that this house was built for them. The residents at the time, this house was custom built around their needs. So does that mean that the house stayed with them, and if necessary the service provider came and went rather than the residents having to leave the house is that right that was my understanding of what we had tried to ensure but we couldn't actually get a clear answer even when i had idrs and legal aid assisting me we could not get any information either from facts or Sunnyfield as to the status of the who owned that house. And what you're talking about with legal aid and IDRS is at the time that Sunnyfield gave you notice yes. that the services would terminate with effect on the 5th of September. So you're talking about that period of time. Um, that was with legal aid and IDRS, but even at the very beginning, at the very beginning, I recall sending an email on behalf of all the families saying, and I'll have to check my records to be 100% certain, but my recollection was that at the time we made a real point of saying this house must be separated from the service supports because I, mean, I, I can, with certainty, I definitely said that 
about the previous supported accommodation provider um, because I remember when we raised the issue of, yeah, um, we, are, we sort of don't want you anymore, <laughs> basically, you're fired. Um, they said, well, you can't do that because we own the house. Right. So some of yeah. the issues that you were concerned about were based on things that had happened Previously, yes. Okay. All right. Can I keep going through the yeah. agreement? Yeah. So this agreement has a provision in it at paragraph 7 called transition to another house. And it deals with the transition of a resident and also the transition of all residents. So can I ask you to focus on clause 7.1, <laughs> which is transition of resident? So I'll put this into the context that if Melissa's support needs change and either Sunnyfield or Melissa or you consider the house is not the most appropriate location to meet Melissa's needs, Sunnyfield will support Melissa to, firstly, move to another Sunnyfield house with a vacancy that has appropriate level of support or B, find alternate supported accommodation services, or C, and or C, apply to the NDIA to seek additional funding to allow Melissa to remain in the current house with increased support levels. All right. Now, this clause becomes important after we get to the notice of terminating services. At the time you were thinking about entering into this agreement, did you pay any attention to paragraph 7.1 and raise any concerns about paragraph 7.1? I don't recall raising any concerns. I remember actually being reassured by it. Sorry, I'll slow down. Sorry, guys. Mm -hmm. um, I remember being reassured by it because <laughs> being rejected. Melissa, sorry, thank you. Melissa has been rejected by a lot of organisations and even individual staff members who have refused to work with her based on the complexity of her disability and challenging behaviours. So I thought if there was any circumstance under which a provider such as Sunnyfield went, eh, been off too much, that like more than we can chew, I'm reassured by the fact that they state that they will find her a higher, um, basically like another place that could support her or they would assist in getting funding in order to do that. Um, and to be honest with you, part of me wonders why their um, uh, attack of me is potentially because they know there's no alternative all right. Well, I don't want you to speculate okay. at yeah, this yeah. stage. Yep. Uh, but just bring you back to the agreement. Yep. And this clause becomes important as to whether that clause applied in the circumstances that led to Sunnyfield notifying you that the services would terminate with effect on the 5th of September. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Now, looking at this agreement, if I can ask you to turn a few pages over to Schedule 2, and if I use the numbers in the top corner, it's 0289. This is described as the Charter of Residents' Rights and Responsibilities. And is this charter something that you looked at and considered when you were entering the agreement? Absolutely. And this is a, a charter of rights that each resident of a Sunnyfield shared living house has the right to be treated with dignity and respect and to live without exploitation, abuse or neglect, to the full and effective use of his or her personal, civil, legal and consumer rights, to quality care appropriate for his or her needs. And there's quite a lot of dot points, but if we go right to the end, the resident has the right to complain and take action to resolve disputes, 
to have access to advocates and other avenues of redress and to be free from reprisal or a well-founded fear of reprisal in any form for taking action to enforce his or her rights. Yes. Now, looking at the, and I've just read a few of the dot points, but looking at the totality of those dot points, did this give you a sense that Sunnyfield uh, would view the rights of residents from a rights-based approach, accepting that they had rights yes. and they could enforce those rights. Absolutely. Now, the next document I want to take you to is behind tab 15. Just before we do that, could, could you help me just understand something you said? In paragraph 15 of your statement, uh, you say, and I think you've indicated that in your evidence today, that Melissa and other residents moved into a purpose-built house in Western Sydney. This is the house we're talking about now. Yes. How, how did it come to be purpose-built for residents, yep. including Melissa? Yep, okay. So when she entered into care around 2010-2011, um, they went from, sorry, guys, <laughs> rental to rental. And each rental needed specific modifications for the clients. So just off the top of my head, the biggest ones were um, security from absconding. Um, so we're talking fences, locks. Um, specifically, sorry, Melissa, specifically required and requires um, a locked kitchen. So but who did these? Oh, who did them? Who did the modifications and under whose instructions or guidance? It was, um, I think, Fax bankrolled it and the previous accommodation provider assisted um, in making it happen. So my understanding was that the rentals, there was issues with them, whether that's neighbours getting upset because the house was too loud um, and there were some racist uh, things that were said by some of the neighbours too that basically forced them out. Um, there was that and the fact there was a lot of property damage. But the, but the, the finance for this and the arrangements yep. were through the State Department and this yes. of course is prior to the NDIS. Yes, I yeah. See, I understand. And uh, who did you, prior to the NDIS, who did you understand was the owner of the premises of the um, facts. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. That helps me. Understand. Sorry. Thank you. I have a tendency to waffle. I apologise. You're not the only one. <laughs> uh, the document behind tab 15. Can I take you to that document? And this is described as the Sunnyfield quote for service. Yep. And you had to sign off on this document as well. Yep. And can I summarise it this way? is that with respect to all of the different types of support, so assistance with daily life, tasks, etc., Sunnyfield had to quote as to what the costs of those services would be. Yes. And that quote then became relevant to the calculation of what the NDIA would fund. I'm yes. really putting that at a simple level. But yes. you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. And this became a document as a, a guide so that you knew what Sunnyfield's charges would be. So there'd be some transparency in the cost based oh, yeah. on the quote. Is that yes. right? Okay. Yep. And you signed off on that? Yes. Right. Now, if you turn now to the document behind tab 21. Yep. This is your email where you talked about the pressure of having to sign the documents before you could obtain legal advice regarding your concerns. Is that right? Yes. Now, one of the big issues that caused you uh, concern about signing off on the documents so quickly was you wanted to talk to Sunnyfield about installing the CCTV. Yes. Uh, and to have some CCTV arrangements in the house. Yes. So you've dealt with this in paragraph 26 of your statement, 
but can I ask you, why were you so concerned about having CCTV in the house? Oh, this is a... Is this, this a, a big, big question? This is okay. a big question, right. so well, feel free to... Well, let's break it, break it me down. In. Yeah. Right. So, ultimately, it comes down to these guys have no voice. <laughs> Melissa, sorry, the guy with the button, <laughs> um, has no voice. And when, you, when you say have, has no voice, what, what exactly do you mean by that? So if you're talking about instances of abuse, neglect, um, you know, exploitation, all that sort of thing, when someone can't be their own witness, can't give their own evidence, they don't have the competency or capacity to speak for themselves in a way that it would be taken seriously by a court or a tribunal, um, that's what I mean by she has no voice. She can't defend herself and I was concerned that things were happening to her and again, it's not just Sunnyfield. This has been a thing for a while um, where I've been very worried that things are happening to her that we're not being told and they're manifesting in her behaviour as distress, um, changes to her personality, changes to her behaviour. The clearest example of like what happened to her when I mentioned previous special school. So that was a gradual thing that happened over a period of two years. And because I was away and out of the house, I'd only see her every now and then, so I could pick up on these big changes. And by the time, like, it hit crisis, was a different, Melissa was a different girl. So was having CCTV in your mind a way of having a record so that what was recorded on the CCTV could tell the story about what might happen? Absol that, that the purpose of absolutely. It? The purpose of it was, was to... Was the, was the purpose to spy on people or <laughs> breach their privacy at all? <laughs> oh, the things I could tell you guys about the arguments around privacy. Oh. Someone... Some regulator, some impartial body has to be able to break this chain of he said and she didn't say because she can't say. So a lot of the allegations and concerns that have been brought up, even just today, like even if we don't talk about the, the past, a lot of them were unsubstantiated because they couldn't be proven now, if there is a objective way, and it, and it works in the other way as well, right? So if a client or a family member were to falsely accuse somebody of wrongdoing, it works as a protective mechanism. And by God, it would save a lot of time in arguing because you take out the, it's an objective look, basically. Um, and I don't have to see it, but someone does. Someone has to. So is that, that why, coming back to when you were signing the agreements, uh, yeah. you had that correspondence with Sunnyfield about the CCTV. And yes. is the upshot that you thought that you were likely to get some agreement in principle about CCTV being used in the house? Definitely. In some form, but without the details of exactly what would happen. Is that right? That's right. Because my, in my discussions with Dr Mark Clayton, um, and he was fantastic because I recall feeling a sense like we were on the same page. And I know that there were a lot of privacy, legal privacy and logistical issues to having that there. But like I say to anyone who will listen, if you're going to make the argument around, well, it's going to be a breach of someone's privacy, when you go to a... if you take this example as, and extrapolate from it, what I'm trying to say here. If you go to a psychologist, you've got a, uh, a right to confidentiality. You've got that private environment to talk about the weirdest things and your deepest, darkest issues. 
But as soon as you say you're going to hurt yourself or you're going to hurt someone else, your privacy goes out the window. Why don't we have the same thing for these poor, vulnerable people who can't speak for themselves? So you wanted the CCTV to be their voice and yes. to bear witness to what was happening to them in the house? Absolutely. But you were not wanting the cameras to be installed so that you could breach the staff's privacy or spy on people, is that right? No, and nor do I think it's appropriate that I have even have access to that because – and I, I think it's identified very well in the email that – um, Dr. Clayton sent to me. He, he, he spoke in real frank terms without all the corporate spin and the stuff on paper that really means nothing. He said, these are the real issues that we have and, and basically the reasons why there's not CCTV in there already. So I reason, honestly, and we all thought it, it wasn't just me, it was all the families because we were all concerned about this issue. We felt that once the chaos of the transition was over, that we would start working through those things. So even if it's just the case of like a camera in the communal area, obviously we're not expecting them to be in bathrooms, we're not expecting them to be in bedrooms. You know, the main areas, entry, exits, um, communal spaces, um, to be seen by a private regulator that only has you know, their interests at heart and obviously to, like, to be a fair and impartial judge of circumstances. There was also a motivation regarding the CCTV to provide some clinical feedback. I recall that being um, an issue and it still is today in the sense that in regards to uh, Melissa's behaviour and the management of, um, often there is a feeling, there's a disconnect between those caring for Melissa and the clinical team, or there's a perceived disconnect in the sense that when people come in, they think that the family or the doctors and clinicians have no idea what it's like on the ground and regional manager one said that to me in explicit terms when she didn't, her and SP1 didn't turn up to a first psychiatrist appointment. I've, I wrote the exact statement in one of my emails, but it was, it was to that effect. And um, it caused me great concern because I know that the job of safeguarding and caring for Melissa is really hard. Like these staff, they all deserve, like they don't get recognised for the work that they do. It is thankless, uh, it's exhausting, and they all, like, they're heroes. I couldn't do it. And I, I worry for them because sometimes, like, the oversight of behaviours is, is tricky. We currently have a system that relies on one person's report of an incident. And if I can even use myself, and I'll come back to the, the issue of the CCTV. I am going to ask you about come back to the CT, yeah. CCTV, but you want to finish this? Yeah, thing. yeah, because it, it, well, it is relevant in the sense that, and I know from myself, so if we, we don't use the staff as an example, we use myself. I um, tried to, I had uh, an incident with Melissa that went for about an hour. And I asked the staff, can you film me um, engaging with her? Because I want to sit down and have a debrief with her um, behavioural specialist and with her doctors. And I want to make sure that they know, that they can see what I'm doing. And it works in both ways, uh, as in one, to get that objective view of what I'm doing, um, and also if I'm, so I can get feedback for myself, but if also if I'm doing everything right and this is still happening, does that mean that she might need to have a medication change or something like that? Now, 
When I wrote down my, my recollection of that incident in terms of that ABC format, so antecedent, so what caused, may have triggered the behaviour, the actual behaviour itself and the consequence or what happened afterwards. Um, when I watched myself back with the clinician, she said, you notice how you didn't really give her much time to respond? And I went, oh my God. There I was, yap, 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 in her face because I was stressed. And, you know, the clinician walked me through it and said, it actually takes like 15 to 20 seconds. So next time, ask her once and wait for a response. So it could be used as a, a learning tool absolutely. to in managing. A absolutely. Family. And also to, yeah, give that direct, yeah, feedback and to show that the clinicians, like the, it goes both ways, it, it will create more trust because the staff will know that they're seeing exactly what she's doing and vice versa, like if there's something that can be, and sometimes the staff, they do everything right, like, and she still does it and give them that reassurance that, hey, there's nothing wrong with you, like, yeah, it's stressful, are you okay, do you need anything, like, and, and that I think will be very beneficial because and it happens with every new staff that comes in. Okay, I'm going to take you Sorry. back to the email that's behind tab 18 in the volume that you've got. Mm. And can you tell me, that is that the email that you are describing earlier from Dr Mark Clayton to you? And it's on the 11th of April 2017. Yeah, that's the one. And Dr. Clayton apologises for not responding earlier to your email in related in related to the use of CCTV. And he says, I support the use of CCTV in principle and understand the context of why this can be considered necessary. The practical realities of employing this can present a range of issues which need to be carefully considered. And he sets out eight particular issues. Yes. And he also says another important component of this is that this would be something the families would need to pay for and maintain. Yeah. And so he said that raises an issue about who owned the recording and the like. All right. Yes. Now, you wanted um, the CCTV to be part of the, the terms of the agreement that you signed. Yes. Is that right? And uh, that's when you got the response to say these are standard legal terms. Yes. I want to put this to you. Ms Cudahy, when she gives evidence later this week, will tell the Royal Commission this about the terms. She'll say these terms concern matters which are not readily susceptible to negotiation or customisation and which cannot be reasonably expected to be qualified or removed such as the rights and responsibilities of each of Sunnyfield and a client, termination rights and payment arrangements. Uh, do you accept uh, what she says, that these are not terms readily susceptible to negotiation or customisation? Not at all. I want to now move on. And uh, the agreements are signed and Sunnyfield move in on the 1st of May 2017. Now you tell the Royal Commission that in the first few weeks and months after Sunnyfield took over the operation of the house, things appeared to be chaotic to you. Now it's a case, isn't it? You were not at the house on a day-to-day -day basis in the first few months, were you? No, that's right. And uh, some people may put to you that you only visited the house every now and then, maybe every three months or so. And so you've never really been in a position to know what the day-to-day -day arrangements at the house have been. What would you say to that? Um, by way of background, I was pregnant at the time that I became Melissa's guardian. I also have a job that put me um, into regional New South Wales. Um, I, could, I don't think anyone's criticising you for not being yeah. there, but the proposition is that 
if you're not there all the time, yeah. then you don't have direct knowledge of what was happening yeah. at the house and how did you know what was happening at the house? Yeah, so there was a few different streams of information. So there was um, when the staff would call, there was mum ringing and writing notes about like basically her own shift notes uh, when she would turn up. I also had clinicians feeding back to me when they were visiting uh, Melissa uh, what was going on um, and I made a real point of reading every shift note, every um, incident report, any bit of documentation I could get my hands on to try and understand what was happening. So that was what informed my um, understanding what was happening at the house at the time. Right. And Sunnyfield would say that when they took over the house at the beginning of May and they also had to move in very quickly and they were told that there'd been a very high turnover of staff at, by the previous service provider and records that should have been there were not, the records were minimal and that there were aspects of the property that were in a state of disrepair and so Sunnyfield had to make some initial uh, repairs over those first few months. Were you aware that Sunnyfield had those issues yeah, so to deal with? Yeah, so if I can respond to a few of those things. So I missed the first part but... The one thing on the documentation was they didn't have to rely on the prior service provider for Melissa's documentation because I gave them everything. And you know how particular I am about the paperwork. They had it all from the very beginning. So that's that part. The second part about the um, uh, modifications and the repairs to the home, I, recall, I think the, the stove was broken. They had no window coverings. And I remember being frustrated because from my view, these strangers were entering the home and they started immediately to make decisions about modifications and repairs and what have you on the house without consulting with the families. And the reason why that was um, a point of frustration at the time was because there were there are certain behaviours that the clients engage in that cause that inform what you do to the physical house. So I recall being um, frustrated, and also because if it was identified to us as a group, as a collective, that the house needed something, I was so willing to fight for funding for them. So they had everything they need, and it's still my and it's always been my position is that. If the staff need something, I will hammer and tongs get it for them because anything that makes their life easier will make <laughs> Melissa's life better. So, um, yeah, in regards to the um, equipment and the house, I felt very excluded from that process, which was a concern only in so far. Sorry, I'll slow down. In so far as it was um, potential detriment. Uh, Melissa. Now, uh, when Sunnyfield took over the house, there were four residents of the house at that time, and you didn't have access to information about the actual staffing levels at the house on a day-by-day -day basis. And you've set out in your statement, paragraph 31, that your understanding was that, generally speaking, the house manager would be present most of the week to provide consistent oversight and that there would be at least one staff member dedicated to Melissa during waking hours. And you make some observations in that paragraph about the arrangements for Carl and Chen as well. So it's a case, isn't it, by mid-2017, you were at the house and you saw that there was only one support worker working on her own in the house. And your mum, who visits Melissa, three days a week, would also tell you that there was only one staff member on at times when she was in the house. And this caused you to start to have concerns about how the house might be operated and again, the impact on Melissa, All right? So that, that's in the early days. Now, you were aware, weren't you, from both the agreements that you signed and some of the information that you had, that Sunnyfield had a complaints and feedback brochure. Yes. 
And I might uh, ask that that document come up on the screen. And commissioners, you'll find a copy of this behind tab 17 in the same bundle. And that some of the writing's a bit difficult to read, so I'm hoping if that comes up on the screen, it might be a little easier to see. All right, so this is uh, the complaints and feedback guide. Have you got that? Yeah, I memorised it. You memorised it. Okay, well, uh, you can help me. Uh, so over the page, we can get that up. It sets out important things to know about giving feedback. Why uh, should you give feedback? Question mark. Giving feedback and who can give feedback. And then there's other matters in terms of raising. So the language here is about feedback, not complaints. Yes. Did you understand there was a difference between feedback and complaints? <sighs> can you maybe give me a bit more parameters around that? Because there's like what the document says and then that's what happens in reality. Right. Well, let's work on what the document says. So this was an important document for you in mm. understanding if you had a concern, yep. you wanted to give feedback, yep. if you had a question about yep. what was happening in the house. Was this the procedure that you thought that you had to follow? Initially, yes. Right. Yeah. But then, yeah, when it came down to it, we were basically told you had to go through SP1. All right. Well, this says you have the right to give feedback or to make a complaint. It makes us better at what we do. Oh, that's coming. You should have that on the screen a little yep. bit bigger than the text. If you want to give feedback, you should do it as soon as you can. You will not be treated differently for saying what you think and how you feel. If you are a client, you will not lose your service. Sometimes we can respond to your feedback straight away. And sometimes we need to find out more before we can respond. This can take time, but we will tell you what is happening and what you can expect to hear from us. All right, so did you, what did you understand this to mean in terms of how you should go about giving feedback, asking questions, or when you might make a complaint? Well, exactly what it says in terms of it's all about communication, right? It's all about speaking up. You see an issue, you tell them. And I honestly, like for every, I think the line got blurred between feedback and complaint. When it was clear, I started to be treated not in a way that was advertised to me, and I went, wow, okay, perhaps if they're not going to listen to like a casual feedback, do I need to complain to get them to pay attention? You've said in your statement that communication between you and Sunnyfield quickly broke down. Yes. To the point that by the 17th of July 2017, you received a letter from the Acting General Manager of Shared Living, which included information about the process by which you were to communicate with Sunnyfield staff. Can I ask you to have a look at what might be the last tab in the volume that you've got behind tab 28? Now, this has got some names that are also subject to redaction or pseudonym orders, and I don't want to go through the document in detail but can I ask you uh, whether you remember receiving this letter and what was your response to receiving this letter? From memory, this came out of when, I, like, when we, the transition first happened, I still had a lot of questions. Um, as we'd already covered, the agreements were very generalised. I wanted some specific answers. I wanted them to lay out for me in no uncertain terms what is it that I'm to expect, particularly around communication. 
And I think this was formulated, and again, I'll need to double check the actual paperwork, but from memory, this letter was formulated prior to me being able to really explain why I was asking these questions. And everything felt very rushed. I felt like a nuisance for asking the question. Um, when I wasn't getting an answer from someone, I'd find someone else within Sunnyfield or externally to try and give me an answer to help me get my bearings as to, okay, well, we're clearly not doing what their policies say that or what they advertised they were going to do. So what, am, what, are, what have I just gotten her into? And so when I got this, it was clear to me that my point of contact with SP1, whether I liked it or not, and then so, sorry, just so SP1. Yes. He had been employed by Sunnyfield as the house manager of the house. Yes. And he commenced, as you say, in paragraph 37 <coughs> around June. So yep. this is a, a letter that you got about a month to six weeks after he'd started. Yes. So the communication between you and SP1 uh, was that difficult from the moment he started, and I'm asking you this because you say in paragraph 37, when you first met him, he came across as very charming, mm. caring, down to earth, and from the things he said to you back then, you got the impression that he would use common sense rather than let technical rules dictate what would happen in the house. Yes. So what happened in those first few weeks that changed your view about SP1 and you've got a communication protocol set out in the letter that I've just taken you to. What happened? Oh, there was a lot of specifics and it was really challenging because I found that SB1 was new to the organisation as well. So he couldn't often answer my questions and so he would defer to someone else um, or he'd say, I'll get back to you. Um, but there were many instances where he didn't or he'd give me half an answer or he hasn't understood what I was asking. And, yeah, it was, um, I think where it started to turn was when we started to get into the nitty gritty around behavioural management. I think that's where it um, really came to a head. So when I said that, I'd let he'd let common sense dictate the home. Melissa has previously been in a situation where people haven't stepped in because they're afraid of doing an unauthorised restricted practice per se, so physically grabbing her. Now, if you're out in the community and Melissa sees something across a busy road, I couldn't have it on my conscience that someone was afraid to stop her going headfirst into traffic. So I wanted it to be really clear in writing and give staff the assurance that if she needed to be physically restrained for her own safety and it was a last resort measure, that people would use common sense and do it. Um, and then when we started having these discussions, um, it became clear to me because SP1 told me explicitly that if he felt Melissa needed to be physically restrained, that he would just do it. You and said that in paragraph 40 of your yes. statement? Yes. Yes. Did that cause you concern? <gasps> yes. Why? Why? Oh, why? Um, well, around the same time, we thought that perhaps there was a sensory component to Melissa's headbanging. And so we um, were making investigations into um, having her room padded to give her a safer environment where she wouldn't hurt herself um, and take the pressure off. Like we were trying to do the least restrictive thing for her because getting hands on with her um, is dangerous for her and for you. She's got osteoporosis, so it wouldn't, and she's small. She's like four foot something. She's the size of an eight year old. And so 
there's a real risk that you're going to hurt her. Now, speaking from experience, because even from before we really understood her behaviour, from as young as she started ex dis expl um, displaying these behaviours, we jumped on her um, because we thought it was the right thing to do. And what I found when we actually, because I pushed to get it in her initial biz plan, uh, because I, again, I thought it was the right thing to do. Sorry, uh, what's the biz plan? Oh, the behavioural intervention support plan. So it's basically the manual of what you're supposed to do when she's engaging in self-injurious behaviour. And the plan is developed with the support of a behaviour support specialist, is that right? Yes, although, do you want me to talk about that part? All right. But the purpose of the plan is to assist the support workers who work with Melissa to know how to uh, understand behaviours yes. and some techniques in responding to particular behaviours so that Melissa can be safe in the house. Correct. Or if she's out of the house, safe in the community. That's the purpose of it. Yes, that's right. It's not that you just sort of decide what to do at no. that moment. No. But the purpose of the plan is to provide some predictability, yes. both for Melissa as to yep. how she might be treated, but also for the support workers to know what to do. Exactly. Is that and a helpful yeah. summary without going into the detail? Yeah, and how to, much of it? how to do it safely. Because people have died. Like, people have died. You put them in a prone position. Um, people don't know that they've, you know, just stopped them breathing and... I'd had several discussions with SB1 around how do we formulate a appropriate plan that would be suitable for the six foot, you know, rugby playing support worker versus the four foot, you know, mother um, in responding to Melissa, yeah. And so this topic about how to manage behaviours and um, how to respond yes. if there was a behaviour that needed a response to keep Melissa safe yes. started to become a source of tension between you and SP1. Yes. And you wanted to raise your concerns about how SP1 was addressing these matters with other people in Sunnyfield. And did that mean that you ended up having to escalate some of these concerns or feedback or complaints, whatever the yes. expression is, up to the level of the company secretary and yes. the CEO from time to time? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And would it be fair to say that throughout the latter part of 2017, as you've set out in your statement, that there were a number of complaints that you made about what might just be incidents that occurred on a day-to-day -day basis or some particular um, incidents that arose. For example, in paragraph 42, you tell the Royal Commission that in late September 2017, Melissa's occupational therapist reported to you that she'd found discarded batteries on the grass at the back of the house and uh, an email was sent to SP1 and the regional manager about it because if Melissa had found them, she could have easily put them in her mouth and tried to swallow them and that would be dangerous for her. Yes. And the regional manager at the time said the batteries were not the Sunnyfield staff's fault as someone outside must have thrown them into the garden. Now, your response to that email was... I wanted to bring the issue of the batteries to your attention, so did the occupational therapist. We were not trying to blame Sunnyfield staff for putting the batteries there, yeah. but to recognise that it was a danger to Melissa. Yeah, that's right. So this exchange highlighted this tension yes. by this stage that was between yes. you and Sunnyfield. Did yes. You say, and I'm going to have to ask Miss Cuddehy about this later oh, yeah. in the week. But is this sort of illustrative of oh. an issue like batteries in the garden then becoming this yeah. ongoing source of tension? Yes, because it was like this a real culture of blame and you couldn't raise an issue without someone being offended. Um, and it was challenging too because the my reading of both... SP1 and regional manager one was that 
they knew better. They knew better than her doctors. They knew better than her clinicians. That was your sense of it. That was my sense because the other. But you don't know for sure whether they did. Well, I mean, that's your sense of it. it Sorry, no regional manager. Well, I suppose I don't know how else you interpret (laughs) quote. and I'll have to look again specifically what she, the actual wording, but it was words to the effect of the doctors don't know, like the psychiatrist doesn't know. They, he's not here. You know, and so from that interpretation of which I don't know how else you could interpret that, um, yes, I felt that they um, thought they knew better. And, and also from SP1's own, own email where he refused to meet with MABO, which is the Crisis Intervention Training Service of Choice of Sunnyfield, who is fantastic, by the way. Um, he, he was marvellous. And SB1's response was, was the effect of, well, unless you're going to put restraint in the plan, I'm not coming. And it was this real difficult, where I knew, it was a real difficult situation, where I knew that to create a plan that was meaningful for the staff, safe for Melissa, and was clinically sound, I needed everyone to do their bit. And I felt a very strong pushback that they weren't interested. That was your perception? Yes. Right. Yes. You didn't know for sure whether they were or weren't interested, but that's your perception at the time, is that right? Of yes, of of SP one and of regional manager one, yes. When we later had a had a meeting, um, I got the sense that the senior managers were were pulling the corporate line, and basically my perception and interpretation of the situation is they basically said to SP one, "Mate, you can't say that. Like, you have to say no. We." use the least restrictive manner, we don't touch her. But later, when I am attending another psychiatrist appointment, I had the staff saying to me, you know that we still do it right. These are other support Support, workers in A support worker working at the home at the time. You, I mean, you say in paragraph 45 of your statement that you became increasingly concerned that Melissa might be physically restrained from time to time. And during a meeting in late 2017, SP1 expressed frustration at being told he could not lock Melissa in her room. Once we had modified it with padding, stated, stating, what's the point of the padding? And you set out your concerns about this attitude and the detrimental effects of seclusion and restraint in an email to the Ombudsman on the 8th of December 2017. Is that right? Yes. And you've provided a copy of the email to the Ombudsman in your statement. I want to sort of keep moving beyond 2017. And you say in paragraph 48, sorry, 46, that uh, another support worker was hired to work in the house and we've described him as SP2. Yes. And you were told that SP2 would be Melissa's key worker? Yes. And you recall SP1 saying words to the effect that you should be happy because uh, all you wanted was a lot of communication with Melissa's key worker and SP2 could speak English. Yep. You sure you're right on the recollection of that conversation? Yes, 100%. And I previously raised issues of racism with this with SP1 as well. And at that time, this is early 2018, you did not have any particular concerns about SP2 at the time, except you say this in your statement, you would have chosen a different person if you were given the choice. Is that a statement that you make with the benefit of hindsight or is that something you thought of at the time? No, I thought of that at the time, but I was being told. I was never asked who would you like to be Melissa's or who do you think you know, would be the best person um, for Melissa. There was no choice, I was told. And by that stage, I was so scared of retaliation that I was just like... Well, Sunnyfield might say to you is, while it had the responsibility of employing staff, 
that the families were given the opportunities to come to interviews if they wanted to, and it may not have been for SP2, but it may have been for SP1 that you didn't go to one of the interviews. Do you remember whether you were given the opportunity to participate in any interviews about the staff who would come and work at the house? My recollection was that they had already chosen SP1, but I was given a um, superficial invitation to provide feedback. Um, and this is, again, where we have a very stark point of difference in our um, interpretation of um, choice and being able to provide meaningful feedback. I've always been of the view that you need to see someone in action for about six months before you can provide, before you know whether they are right for the house or not. And I've seen some fantastic support coordinators in my time. I've gone through, well, since I've been Melissa's guardian, there's been 10. Um, that's including both accommodation providers, there's been 10. About one a year. Yeah, well, well no, I, I, Two a year. Two a year. Two a year. So I've seen a lot of different styles, a lot of different ways of approaching things, and I know uh, with certainty you can't give an informed choice until you know because they can say whatever they like on their resume, on their LinkedIn profile. It doesn't mean anything until you actually see them under pressure and you see how they speak to you, how they speak to Melissa, how they respond to issues, how they raise those issues um, with the staff and you know how they how they speak to the clients how they consider them and then you know when i do see <laughs> melissa because i do get a lot of videos from our mum uh, and obviously from other clinicians and when i read the notes i can sort of piece together what she's thinking about certain people and um, it's not a super clear picture all the time because if it was clear, I would have made sure I raised some concerns about SP2. But yeah, I had no idea. I didn't particularly think he was a good fit, but I didn't see any flags um, with him that gave me concern. Like I was shocked when I found out. Um, okay, we'll, we'll get we'll get to yeah. that a little down the track. Uh, I wanted to just uh, ask you about the early part of 2018, and it's a case, isn't it, that the New South Wales Ombudsman offered to conciliate yes. between you and Sunnyfield? Yes. You've mentioned this at paragraph 59 of your statement, and your understanding is Sunnyfield declined to conciliate, and that was that, was that in relation, I think, by the stage to two complaints that had been made to the Ombudsman? Um, I can't remember the amount of complaints. There was a lot because by that stage, um, so much had banked up because things just weren't addressed for such a long time that uh, sent, <laughs> sent the ombudsman a lot of emails. Um, and what I was just um, so perplexed by at the time was that the ombudsman, my understanding, was that they're an impartial body that... Their primary concern is Melissa. And they would, <clears throat> in the same breath, say to me, Eliza, I, I think you're being unreasonable here. I think you need to take it down a notch or, you know, mm, yeah, don't know about that. Um, maybe try it. They, they would give me that feedback as well as Sunnyfield. So I remember being completely floored that someone would ignore an invitation because that's a mediation service that can be done for free. That, that caused you to be upset, didn't it? That, that oh, yeah. Sunnyfield weren't prepared, yes. as you understood it, to participate in a, a conciliation at that time. Yes, because communication was so bad. We needed help. I had reached out to everyone within Sunnyfield to get that help to improve that communication. And um, yeah, 
<laughs> no, you're not saying, are you, that in terms of when you made complaints and gave feedback that, you know, sometimes you were quite direct in the language that you used and the way you described events and the things that you wanted to happen. I don't, you don't shy away from oh. being quite direct, do you? No, and I, I have made apologies for that and I'll continue to do so because it's, it's difficult, like... I have a, I've always been a very direct person and I don't get offended easily so sometimes it can be difficult for me to pick up when I've offended somebody and it really uh, was highlighted to me when I was denied the opportunity to speak directly or face to face with SP1 and other staff in the home because I've been told that I'm a bit nicer in person than I am on paper, um, but I constantly felt like, well, if they don't have time or they don't see the value in or they think I'm being frivolous, vexatious, whatever, um, I better keep some notes. Um, and so, and it got difficult too because the soft skills that you need to manage people around, um, you know, asking how their day was and doing all the little niceties, it doesn't come naturally to me. I'm very... Um, well, you're not there that often to have those sorts of conversations. Oh, uh, but by God, I tried so hard. Like, I, I did everything I can because I, I know it's important because at the end of the day, the relationships matter. Um, we can call this a private ser business service, whatever, but at the end of the day, we're relying on people to be good and to be honest and truthful. Um, and, um, yeah, I really tried to address it. And I know I have repeatedly said um, to Sunnyfield that, you know, I'm open to changing the way I do business, provided that you listen to my concerns um, and tell me if I'm jumping ahead here, but... That's right, because I'm conscious of the time and yep. I'm going to say to the commissioners in a moment we might have a short break because yep. the next topic I want to deal with is the 4th of June yeah. 2018, which is when you receive the notice. Mm. So um, do you want to come back later to what you're open to do and yeah. this is part of some yep. of the outcomes that you're seeking? Yeah, definitely. All right, yep. so we might... if Commissioners, can we have... Uh, a short adjournment would 15 minutes yeah, give you another yeah, time fine. just yeah. to have a bit of a break and then we can resume. Yes, we'll adjourn now and return at 3.20. Will that give you enough time? Yeah, uh, yes, certainly. Okay, we'll take the 15 minute break. We'll adjourn now. The Royal Commission is adjourned. Eighteen, yep. and on that day you received a letter from Sunnyfield and you, can I ask you to look in the folders that you've got but this time to volume two oh. and the document is behind tab 29. Yep. I remember receiving this letter. Looks oh. like by email. Oh, yeah. They sent me a copy via post too, just in case. Just in case. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, this letter says it's headed Notice of Cessation of Services to Melissa, effective 5 September 2018. And it says, we are writing after lengthy internal consideration to inform you that Sunnyfield has decided it is unable to continue to provide support for your sister, Melissa. As per Sunnyfield's service agreement with Melissa, the purpose of this letter is to provide three months' notice of cessation of Sunnyfield's services to Melissa, with the notice period therefore expiring on 5 September 2018. 
We confirm that the accommodation agreement entered into with Melissa will terminate at the same time as the service agreement and Melissa will therefore be required to leave the house no later than 5pm on Wednesday 5 September 2018. All outstanding rental contributions and fees must be paid for on or before that date. We are able to assist you if required to approach another service providers, sorry, other service providers regarding supported independent living and specialist disability accommodation services for Melissa. And the, let, the letter goes on and it says uh, in the last paragraph on that page, if for any reason a new provider of supported independent living services is not found for Melissa before 5 September, then you, as Melissa's guardian, will need to assume responsibility for Melissa's accommodation and support from that time. If you require any further information, please do not hesitate to contact me. And that letter was CC'd to the CEO of Sunnyfield, Ms Cudahy. Now, you have told the Royal Commission at paragraph 61 of your statement that this letter giving you notice terminating the services and in effect evicting Melissa came out of the blue for you. Yes. You remember receiving the email when you were at work and yep. you were shocked. And what, your immediate reaction was that you were terrified Melissa was going to lose her home and about the impact this would have on her? Yes. Tell the Royal Commission that even though things were not good in terms of how the house was being run by Sunnyfield, it was still her home and you knew it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to find somewhere else appropriate for her to live. Yes. Did you feel when you received that letter that it gave you any reason as to why Melissa's services and accommodation would be coming to an end and she had to vacate by 5pm on the 5th of September? What did, you, what did you think the reasons were? Spite. That was your immediate sense? That was my immediate sense because I spoke up about SP1 ad nauseum. I tried to approach everyone who would listen and I felt unsupported, not believed, in hindsight from some of the things I learned today, gaslighted that there was no problem, that I was the problem. They knew I had no capacity to look after Melissa. I felt this was motivated by personal grievances that even though like things were hard and things had deteriorated to a point, I was so open and so wanting them to just sit down and let's talk about it. And I felt stonewalled at every opportunity and I couldn't understand why. Right. You wanted to get some reasons though, didn't you? Yes. From Sunnyfield. So you made some requests for reasons. Yes. And you did receive a letter also sent to you by email on the 13th of June, 2018. So this is a, a nine days after the letter. Can you turn to the document behind tab 30 in the volume that you have? Yes. And uh, do you recall receiving this email or letter? Yes. And it makes a reference to the service agreement between Sunnyfield and you as Melissa's representative. Yes. And the author of this letter says that the agreement provides both parties with the option to terminate 
the agreement with three months notice in three months written notice and it says this the decision does not need to be mutually agreed and nor does Sunnyfield need to provide any reasons for exercising its option to terminate the agreement. This approach is consistent with the underlying ethos of the NDIS, where flexibility of choice and control is conferred on both the participant and the service provider. Do you recall reading that? Yeah. yeah. Now, with respect to the decision does not need to be mutually agreed, had there been any attempt at all, to the best of your memory, of Sunnyfield seeking to agree with you about Melissa moving to a new provider before the 4th of June? No, there was no discussion about any alternative. There was just me speaking to a brick wall um, about things that were worrying me about her care. And um, in terms of what's described as the underlying ethos of the NDIS, had it been your understanding that flexibility of choice and control was also something that applied to service providers? Not in this way. If they had made reasonable attempts to just speak to me and uh, an impartial body like the Ombudsman or uh, I think the Community Justice Centre we made inquiries with at the time uh, or <laughs> even later on with the NDI Safeguards and Quality Commission, if they had said, nah, you know, Sunnyfield, you've tried the best you can. Uh, Eliza's obviously a pain in your backside and she's unreasonable. Suppose you've got to ditch her out. Um, then I would have gone, okay, well, that was fair. I got fair notice. I got due process, um, you know, common human decency maybe, um, that you would actually speak to someone before you made such a drastic decision that could have such severe consequences. But you don't, coming back to my question, you Sorry. don't remember any discussion about some sort of mutual agreement before the 4th of June letter, is that right? You're talking about an alternative yes. provider? Yes. No. It wasn't raised with you? No. So you had no warning? No. That, you know, you better pull your socks up, so to speak, otherwise we might have to exercise that clause in the contract about yeah, termination. No. no one gave you any warning? No. Right. Can I come back to the letter? So yep. this is uh, behind tab 30. Mm-hmm. So the General Manager Shared Living says in the letter, Sunnyfield does currently have a duty of care to Melissa while we are providing services to her under the terms of our service agreement and as stated in our letter of 4 June, we will continue to support Melissa providing, uh, sorry, support Melissa appropriately during the notice period. However, once Sunnyfield ceases providing accommodation and support to Melissa on 5 September 2018, you as her guardian will be responsible for making the decision about where Melissa will live and who will support her. Now, pausing there, uh, how did that, how did you take this in circumstances where the agreement, which we looked at a little earlier today, talked about looking at alternative accommodation at Sunnyfield with a higher level or looking at different service providers. Did it cause you any concern that this paragraph seemed not to be consistent with the agreement that you'd signed? Yes. All right. Now, can I ask you to look at the next paragraph? It says this, whilst we are not obliged to give you reasons for our decision, Sunnyfield has made the decision to cease providing services because following a period of over 12 months of service delivery and despite our best endeavours, we have concluded it is not in Sunnyfield's overall best interest to continue to provide services in an environment where you so clearly lack trust in Sunnyfield, our staff and our policies. Despite Sunnyfield's multiple attempts, 
intervention from the New South Wales Ombudsman, an ongoing dialogue between yourself, Sunnyfield has determined that it is unlikely the relationship will improve. Now, as at the 13th of June, or indeed a week or so before on the 4th of June, did you hold the view that the relationship was unlikely to improve? No, I think it didn't get, it didn't, it, I was never given the chance. It never got a chance because how can you build a relationship when they refuse to sit down with you without their lawyers making you sign a confidentiality agreement? No offence, guys. You were told this decision has not been taken lightly. You'd accept that, wouldn't you? I don't, I don't know how you can, I don't know how you can say that with the nature of what this means for Melissa. I, I, I don't know how you can say that and only have a single hour conversation with Melissa's guardian and, and approve and sign off on something as extreme as making a disabled voiceless girl um, homeless? Well, the letter says we understand the disruption it could cause, Melissa. However, despite Sunnyfield's significant investment of resources, time and commitment to address, as we have been able to, we have been unable to develop a positive and productive relationship between Sunnyfield and yourself, we have concluded that we have to make this decision. That, that gave you the reason, didn't it? It was because of the relationship between you and Sunnyfield. Yes, what I couldn't understand is how they can refer to intervention from the New South Wales Ombudsman when they refuse their offers for help. Because like I said, they were just in the same breath as tell them what to do as tell me what to do. Um, I couldn't, I don't understand how you can make that statement. And I, I, despite all that has happened, I am committed to working through it, despite all this, because <laughs> Melissa, Melissa needs us too. It'd be fair to say, when you received that letter of the 13th of June, it made you furious. Yeah. And you responded with an email the following day, which commissioners, and you will find behind tab 31. Yep. And um, you refer to the accommodation agreement and the service agreement. Yes. And you say that you note that Melissa has paid her fees and she's not in breach of the agreement. Yes. And you say, I have previously asked for your reasons for terminating my sister's accommodation and services. However, these were not provided until your last letter, which shows that my sister is being evicted because I made complaints on her behalf. I do not agree that you have the right to withdraw accommodation and services from my sister for the following reasons. And then you set out a number of reasons. And can I summarise them? Yes. And commissioners, you have the, the document there. Firstly, that the house where she lived was a purpose-built house for her. And this is the issue that I think you spoke about earlier in your evidence about your understanding that the New South Wales government had guaranteed that residents cannot be evicted for the first two years from these homes. So that was reason one. Secondly, you said it is illegal to evict someone because they've made a complaint against your company. Thirdly, it's unfair. And you say because Sunnyfield used a standard form agreement and refused to negotiate its terms. The terms in the standard form agreement include those relating to termination, do not take into account my sister's disability. Despite referring to the involvement of the New South Wales Ombudsman in your letter, you have not allowed them to complete 
their intervention or provide recommendations in order to resolve issues and move forward. Despite referring to, quote, multiple attempts to improve our working relationship, you have not responded in good faith or at all to many of my concerns and refused to enter into mediation with the Ombudsman and the Community Justice Centre prior to, prior to sending through the eviction notice. And then you make a without prejudice offer, which is that you are willing to work with Sunnyfield and the NDIS to find your sister alternative accommodation and services that are suitable for her, and you request Sunnyfield confirm that she will not be evicted nor have her services withdrawn until that has happened. And please confirm that you agree to these arrangements and your eviction notice is withdrawn. Right, so uh, did you get legal advice before sending that letter? Yes. Now, behind the scenes, uh, you had immediately contacted the uh, service support coordinator, which is a, another uh, organisation. And the two of you had started to make inquiries about alternative accommodation, is that right? Yes. And you'd looked at, I think, over the course of a few weeks, uh, you'd made inquiries at 13 different providers. Yeah. Um, what happened? It was, it was extensive. So, like, I was really relentless and I found that there was... Like there was a team of us, obviously, um, looking for alternatives. Um, so we drew up a list and looked at every possible um, so, uh, accommodation service. Did, just did Sunnyfield uh, make any of these inquiries on your behalf of other no. providers? No, no. Was asked. there ever an offer for Sunnyfield to make these inquiries? No, we asked because um, I said, hey, do you know of anyone? And... No, no. So we kept looking. Um, so we scouted, and I've got a, I've got a spreadsheet, and it's about it's almost a hundred lines long of each individual agency, person, builder, everyone I engaged with, and I kept notes um, for every follow up. The reasons why, or if she was on a wait list. Um, you know, who I spoke to, the wait list she was on. I um, filled out numerous um, forms. Um, I also realised around that time that it was really difficult because the market just isn't there. So um, we're looking for a very specialised physical home and um, it's actually really hard to find a physical house with a locked kitchen or even just a house that's built post-1960, that's not an open you, plan, that you could stick yeah. a wall in. Um, you say that paragraph 67, uh, you say most houses built after 1960 have open plan kitchens that cannot yep. be modified to secure them properly. Correct. And as you say in that paragraph, by the 9th of July, you'd approached by that stage more than 18 providers and none could offer suitable alternative accommodation for Yes. Melissa. The two were willing to provide supports to Melissa. Yeah. And is this the issue about a new uh, service provider coming into the home operated by Sunnyfield? Was that you gave some evidence about that earlier today? No, so that was that one of the suggestions. Yeah, that was that happened sort of earlier on because we were at panic stations because um, obviously the clock was ticking and um I had a sense that it was going to be hard, no, impossible, because we'd already done that search before when we went from the previous service provider to here. So I had a general idea and I had some experiences, sorry, I had some experiences with um, some other organisations in the Sydney region um, and they were pretty scary. Uh, to, so I knew that there were certain providers I didn't want to go near um, from my own experience with them and the things that they did to Melissa. Um, so uh, just going back, so around that time, I also considered, so it started off, 
around where she is now in, in Sydney. And then we got to a point where we realised actually she needs a proper assessment, like we need a formal report in order to um, give prospective providers all the answers they need in a form. So um, it was very tricky. So we, we got a an OT that actually uh, knew Melissa from when she was a child and knew our family. And um, she wrote a very detailed um, living, I can't remember the name, it was like housing and um, living assessment which we provided and it lays out things that are relevant for prospective providers in terms of um, obviously a bit of background, her service support needs, um, client matching information, um, obviously you know the structure of the house, what it needed to be in terms of a robust build and a improved livability build. Um, and Another factor that was important was making sure that she was within a reasonable driving distance of either our mum or myself. And around that time I decided, when we'd sort of exhausted the Sydney region, let's look at where I live in regional. So this was all in this period, in the month or so after uh, the notice? From memory, yes. Um, because it's been an ongoing issue, hasn't it, to look for alternative accommodation oh, up to about when COVID hit last year, is yeah, that right? Yeah, it was really... So the, the two providers that were willing, they had no physical home, but they were willing to provide supports um, provided we could find a home. Um, and... Yeah, like that all happened and it's still, the active looking and searching stopped um, when COVID struck, but it's still there in the background in the sense that um, if I find a place that's better suited, I will make steps, but I've got to also think about what's best for me. Because I know, I mean, Melissa, because, um, She's now, we're now at a point where a few years have passed. S staff have got to know her. The current staff that are ha at the house at the moment um, are probably the best she's ever had. Um, there's a few that's missing from there because they couldn't tolerate working under Sunnyfield and SP1 and they left, which is really unfortunate. Um, but um, yeah, like the search is passively going on in the background, but yeah. So can I take you back? Yep. I will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Back to this period of July, June, July, 2018. Yes. And I just want to come back to what you told the Royal Commission in your statement. Mm. So you wrote to a lot of people and organisations to see what could be done to stop Melissa losing her home. Yes. And that included in July, 2018, writing to the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission about the eviction. This is your paragraph 70. Yep. And you say the person you were dealing with told you that they did not have the power to stop Sunnyfield from evicting Melissa. Now, Mr Head, it will tell the Royal Commission later this week that the NDIS Commission emailed you informing that it would take no further action on the complaint because the complaint was with the New South Wales Ombudsman. So that's what Mr Head says I'm summarising his paragraph 17 to 20 of his statement. Does that accord with your recollection? Yes, the giant game of handball, it's not my problem, that's what I know it as. Right, and then you engage the Intellectual Disability Rights Service, which is a community legal centre, to yes. help you fight the eviction. And yes. you also had assistance, I think, from legal aid as well. Yes. So that's a lot of lawyers writing letters back and forth, is that right? Yes. And then... Um, out of that process, uh, there was a proposal for a mediation. Now, Ms Cutter, he says, well, the mediation didn't occur till December 2018 to fit into your schedule and that Sunnyfield arranged and paid for a formal independent mediation to be conducted by an independent agency. And there, were, there was the mediation on the 6th of December. 
Now, for you, one of the issues about the mediation was the requirement of confidentiality and that you could not disclose what occurred in the mediation. Is that right? Yes. Um, but the outcome of the mediation was that it was agreed that Sunnyfield would continue to provide services for Melissa while you sourced alternative accommodation and services for Melissa. Yes. And Ms Cudahy says in the statement that she's going to give to the Royal Commission that you haven't provided any update on the status of this process. Do you agree with that? In that statement, she refers to an email, and I did wonder whether she read it before she made that statement, because in it, it says um, that the business of updating Sunnyfield on my progress in trying to relocate Melissa was most appropriately done um, by my specialist support coordinator, or Melissa's specialist support coordinator. And I left that to her. So, and I did so because my opinion was I'm using every spare moment of my time between being a first time mum of a young boy, um, between holding a very stressful job that takes me all over the state, um, and trying to advocate for Melissa's interests, my view was I'll tell them when I found something, I'll tell them when I got something concrete because anything else would just be a waste of time. Um, if I know we had informal conversations, if I can skip forward to when we um, had a better working relationship with the now. I want, I want to come oh, to that. So I want to just sort yep. of keep at this uh, mm -hmm. end of 2018. So you had the yep. mediation. Yep. Now, after the mediation, do you remember receiving a letter from the Ombudsman? Yes. And you've included in your statement as an annexure and commissioners, this is tab 34. There's a letter from the Ombudsman to you on the 18th of December. Now, it's quite a lengthy letter. It covers a lot of issues. Yes. But you've said the upshot from your understanding of this letter is that the uh, Ombudsman, this is paragraph 73, did not take any further action with respect to your complaints and your understanding was that the complaints were closed by the Ombudsman, is that right? Yeah, because the timing of um, when the Safeguards and Quality Commission um, rolled out, um, there was a um, passing of the buck from the New South Wales Ombudsman to the Safeguards and Quality Commission. Um, my, the benefit of their letter is that I felt supported in the sense that they reviewed all the information about the specific issues that I was raising because one of the biggest concerns um, with the um, dissolution of the relationship with Sunnyfield is that it's distracting, like the personal issues with me are distracting from the actual reasons I wanted to talk in the first place, which is my little sister. And it's difficult because they were, and, and the ombudsman backed me on this, which I appreciated, because they would tell me. They would tell me if I was being frivolous or vexatious or wasting their precious time. I wanted to talk about that. Mm -hmm. and, and I felt it at least gave me a sense of I'm not going crazy. I'm not... And that I'm not just being a hypochondriac. I'm not just um, complaining for the sake of it because it's not fun. <laughs> My God, it is not fun. And um, I would much rather be working on positive, you know, uh, things to implement for Melissa that are, are positive and enriching. And I'd I'd rather be spending time talking to the, to the staff about, oh, you know, what, it, what resources do you need to take it to this place? Or, you know, is there anything I can get for you? Like, I would, oh, I would much rather do that than have to chase issues that were serious. And so if 
nothing else, their closing letter and the two um, women that were involved from the New South Wales Ombudsman, they at least said, you might send a lot of emails, but you're not crazy. Like, there are issues here. We can see them. And we've, said, we've, we've told them. We've told, we've told Sunnyfield that we believe that they have, you know, their responses are lacking or they've been unreasonable or the reason why, you know, I've sent so many emails <laughs> was in part because they didn't respond to them in the first place. All right. So the result of the mediation meant that Melissa has stayed in the house. Yes. And as you understand it, the formal eviction notice, but perhaps the notice from the 4th of June 2018, has never been formally withdrawn. Is True. that right? True. True. And you tell the Royal Commission, this is your paragraph 78, that you continue to live with the threat of eviction looming over Melissa. Yep. And your understanding, though, is that the eviction could not be enforced now because too much time has passed, but it still worries you. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Cause Ms. Like yep. So Ms Cudahy says in her statement that she will say at the present time it's not clear to her whether you are still seeking to find alternative accommodation. You've seen that in her statement. Yes. All right. How do you have a view? How could it be that years after this mediation concluded that both you and Sunnyfield are still not sure what's happening? Does that come as some surprise to you? <laughs> no, because the communication, um, while it's better now, it's still lacking. Um, it's still not great in the sense that I have been following in good faith the communication instructions given to me and I've done my best to document them. Um, and, you know, my specialist sport coordinator has been with me for pretty much every conversation I've had with the regional manager to, to um, verify that account. Right. Um, so can I ask you, the current state in terms of finding alternative accommodation in the matters that you've set out in paragraph 98 of your statement, but can I ask you this, are you still fearful that Melissa might be evicted? Yes. And do you want Melissa to remain at the house? Yes. And are you fearful that having to come and give evidence at the Royal Commission might, in a sense, enliven... Absolutely. Fear about eviction. Absolutely. Because this could all have gone away with, I'm sorry, we stuffed up. Let's work together. Let's sit down and have a chat about it. I, I, are, you honestly, are you open to oh, finding yes. a resolution? Oh, yes. 100%. If, if honestly, if Miss Cudahy said that to me, I'd be like, when do you want to meet? Do you want me to fly up? Like, what can I do? And, and, cause I, and I know from speaking with her, that one hour conversation that we've ever had. Um, I remember we agreed on a lot in principle. I don't know what's going on between, I know what's being said between staff. It's a little bit clearer to me after your opening statement though. <laughs> um, but a lot of those perceptions I think can be turned around if there is that genuine attempt to go all right let's work together let's sort out because I'm open to listening to their feedback too because there was issues that were raised by Jennifer Luff um, that I've actually taken on board like earlier on and I've really made a concerted effort to try and um, work with them and even where I don't agree with something they're doing I'll let them run with it. And, um, but when it doesn't work or things, I'll speak up as I have and I will continue to do that. Um, and I, from everything that we've gone over in terms of agreements, policies, if, if they can walk the talk, I can see no reason why we can't work it out. Yeah. Uh, commissioners, I'm mindful of the time and there's still a few other matters that I need to cover arising in Eliza's statement and they include some events in 2019, the 
that I referred to in opening this morning. And also Eliza's views about some of the systemic issues and some matters that she'd like to raise with the Royal Commission. Could I suggest that we adjourn now and uh, Melissa, uh, sorry, Eliza can finish her evidence tomorrow morning if we can start at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Eliza, is that okay with you? Absolutely, yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming today and thank you for coming tomorrow. We'll resume at uh, 10 o'clock. And thank you, Eliza's husband, for giving Eliza support. Um, could you perhaps indicate what will be happening after Eliza concludes her evidence tomorrow? Then, um, it, all being well, our next witness will be Sophia, who's Carl's mother, and she will give her evidence. And then we propose, in terms of the order, that Jenny Peeled, the investigator, will give her evidence following... Sophia. But commissioners, we um, want to make sure that there's ample time for uh, the witnesses to be able to give their evidence. So if those following the webcast and in the room can be patient with us as we work our way through the evidence, that our timing might not be 100% accurate, but we'll stick to the order that we've indicated in the outline of the witnesses giving evidence at the hearing. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, we'll adjourn until 10 o'clock tomorrow. The Royal Commission is adjourned.